Good afternoon, everyone joining us from Europe, and good morning to those joining from the Americas. I am Angus Armstrong, Director of Rebuilding Macroeconomics. Uh, welcome to our fifth in the series of our workshops entitled um, Exit Strategies. This one in particular is looking at uh, monetary finance in the age of coronavirus, MMT and the Green New Deal. For those who are new to rebuilding macroeconomics, we are a, an ESRC funded uh, research network where we support interdisciplinary and new methods of research to address our most pressing macroeconomic questions. If you'd like to find out more, we have a website, uh, rebuildingmacroeconomics.ac.uk, and a monthly newsletter, which is probably the best way to keep in touch with what we're doing. Our next workshop is next week, uh, which will be chaired by Dame Henrietta Moore, entitled Better Jobs. So you'd be most welcome to join us for that as well. For today, I'm very grateful to our two chair persons who've put this workshop together, Roger Farmer, who's Professor of Economics at Warwick University, and also a member of the Rebuilding Macroeconomics Management Group and a co-leader of our Instability Research Hub at Rebuilding Macroeconomics, and Megan Green, who's a Senior Fellow, fellow at Harvard Kennedy School, as well as um, uh, a very well-known uh, interlocutor uh, with regular articles in publications such as the Financial Times, and Megan's also on the advisory group of Rebuilding Macroeconomics. So just two items of housekeeping before I pass it over to Roger to start. If you have questions as the sessions are going through, please type them in the chat, and they'll be collected and passed to the two chairpersons, who will then decide how to read them out at the appropriate time to our panelists. That's for the first two, for, the, for, for each of the sessions. At the end of the workshop, there will be a, an hour where we'll have a discussion between all of the participants. And here it will be a much more open session. So it'll be a question of raising your hand and you'll be called on uh, by Megan in that instance to um, unmic yourself uh, 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 and um, uh, read your own question out. So that's much more of an interactive session towards the end. So before we pass over to Roger, can I all ask, can I ask those who are not taking part in the first panel to put themselves on mute? And if you could, um, if you also um, uh, stop the filming side, then that would make the bandwidth much better. This is being recorded and a recording will be sent out probably at the beginning of next week. So there's a full recording that will be made available. And with that, Roger, I pass over to you. Thank you and enjoy the conference. So that's excellent. Thank you very much, Angus. Um, I'm delighted to have uh, an amazing lineup of people here today uh, to talk about um, modern monetary theory. Uh, and I, I would say that um, I, I, the first time I really came across these ideas was a couple of years ago when I was interviewed by uh, a mature graduate student, Phil Armstrong, from the University of Southampton, Solon, for a, a, a book that he's producing. Uh, of interviews with uh, both regular and uh, heterodox economists. And um, uh, uh, he, in, he, he asked me some questions then about mon modern monetary theory. And I must say at the time, it was something that was fairly distant on my horizon. And in the last couple of years, it's really become uh, much more in, in the public um, eye. Um, and uh, we're delighted to have, uh, to open this session with, um, uh, with Warren Mosler, who uh, is uh, an American economist, a hedge fund founder, an engineer, a professional automotive designer, and a politician. And I would say that most recently, uh, he's been a major proponent uh, and research financier of post-Keynesian modern monetary theory. Um, and uh, he will talk for the first 10, 15 minutes or so. Uh, and then he will be followed by Nariana Kochilakota, who is the Lionel W. McKenzie Professor of Economics at the University of Rochester, uh, a faculty member on the Simon Business School at the University of Rochester, uh, and a research associate at the MBR. I, I've known uh, Nariana for many years, and interest, most interestingly, Nariana was president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis from 2009 and to, to 2015, 
uh, and um, I would say he was one of the uh, most open-minded uh, people at that time that um, that, uh, that I've come across. So I'm very much looking forward to this debate, um, and I will uh, ask you, Warren, to, to kick this off. Okay, let me see if I can get my sharing up. How's that? Uh, that's great. Okay, good. So I'm going to st uh, start with what I call MME, MMT contributions to the to the uh, discussion, and I'd, I'd like to say uh, that I've been doing this for about 30 years now, and that the people in you know I've, I've gone to meetings at the Federal Reserve you know uh, regularly uh, up until about 10 years ago, and the people in monetary affairs uh, at the time, the head, I think, was Vince Reinhardt. Uh, they understand this implicitly. There's no, not even necessary for discussion. It all goes without saying. Uh, you know, Vince helped me write a couple of my speeches. But when you asked about the people on the FOMC, the political appointees, he would say, yeah, that's exactly the problem. He said, there's just absolutely no understanding of these basic monetary operations. And so that's, that, that the understanding of monetary operations, I think, uh, you know, getting it from the Fed out to the public has been the major contribution of, uh, of modern monetary theory. So I'll, I'll start with the, some ideas here that will then be fleshed out a little bit. The currency is a public monopoly. The dollars to pay taxes come only from the, the Fed or its agents, which in this case is commercial banks through arrangements with the Fed. So the source of the dollars to pay taxes or to buy bonds um, is the government itself. Okay, they don't come from the private sector, they originate in the state. And the way they say it inside the Fed is, you know, of course you can't do a reserve drain without doing a prior reserve act. It's a little bit technical, but it's the same thing. This, um, the funds to pay taxes and to buy bonds come from the state. Okay, and so that brings up the question of sequencing, which comes first. And if you go to any congressman, any member of parliament, they will tell you that they have to get money through taxing to be able to spend. What they don't tax, they have to borrow from China, I believe the bill to our grandchildren, uh, to be able to spend, which as a matter of monetary operations is completely backwards. The uh, actual sequence is that you have to do a reserve ad before you can do a reserve drain. There has to be spending before the funds are available to pay taxes or to buy bonds. And now lending is, it's spending or lending you might say, but lending is actually a subcategory of spending because in the process of lending, the, the lender is purchasing the promissory note of the uh, borrower. And so it's, it's a, it can be said to be a spending. So spending covers it. Spending comes first, uh, followed by the actual payment of taxes or the uh, purchase of securities. And so if you've got spending coming first, you're not revenue constrained. So there, that whole concept is inapplicable. The government isn't revenue constrained per se. Uh, the next thing is, is the, uh, the unemployment story, which I'll get into in the next slide. Uh, the price level, we all know that monopolist is price setter, not price taker. And there is no market for this thing. We all know that the monopolist sets two prices, one that's called the uh, own rate, which is how his, his item exchanges for itself. In this case, that's the interest rate. We all know the Fed, and I'll, I'll talk from the American point of view, but it's the same around the world. The Fed um, is the monopoly, the single supplier of reserve balances to its, its own spreadsheet, which is the banking system, where the banking system has accounts. The banks have member banks and governments have accounts. And as single supplier, it has to set interest rates. There's no market for the Fed funds rate. That's why it's voted on uh, at every meeting. Okay. Uh, and the last thing I'll touch on is interest rate policy. And this is not necessarily a um, something uh, people in the Fed would, they, they will agree on the, on the fundamentals, but not necessarily on where, how it all comes out. And I, and I agree with them. We don't know how it comes out, but as the public debt gets larger, the state is a larger and larger net payer of interest as it raises rates. And uh, which tends, I think, uh, is left out 
the interest income channels are left out of interest rate analysis and higher rates are add exactly that much to uh, net government spending all else equal and so higher rates per se are fiscal expansion and uh, therefore an inflationary bias and a um, uh, uh, expansionary bias and secondly you have the forward pricing channel where a rate increase for example increases the difference between spot and forward prices for in theory the entire economy which is actually the academic definition of inflation itself and so in that sense you could say the policy rate is the rate of inflation okay and now let me just move on here i don't want to dwell on that last one because it's not particularly important in the crisis at the moment but it will be critical okay so we tell the money i tell i started off telling it we all tell them now tell the money story in this way we're not saying the old money stories are wrong about barter or whatnot i'm not I, I just don't care okay but today's money story begins with a state uh, that desires to provision itself largely with uh, labor and so uh, we need a military we need public people working in public health the legal system and whatnot and the way we do it is number one we establish tax liabilities for the further purpose of creating sellers of goods and services who need the tax credit, in this case, the US dollars, uh, to avoid tax penalties. So number one, in terms of provisioning the state is to establish tax liabilities. Uh, and, uh, and not as the normal story would go to collect taxes, but to establish the liability, which creates people looking for paid work in that currency, which is our, how we define unemployment. So you could say tax liabilities by design create unemployment for the further purpose of provisioning the state. Uh, third, state spending of the tax credit, in this case, US dollars, then provisions the state. It goes out and hires the uh, who, people who the tax created to become unemployed, to become soldiers and uh, public health workers and public education and everything else. Uh, after spending we have uh tax payments okay and uh treasury securities purchases are now uh funded you might say by state spending so state spending provides the reserve ad that uh, facilitates the reserve drain of tax payments and uh purchasing treasury securities state spending as i said before would also include lending repos and whatnot it's all reserve ad, it's all subcategory of spending. So let me go on to number three here. So uh, in terms of monetary finance now, well, let's, say, let's look at what is the public debt, okay? The public debt consists of, to the penny, all the US dollars spent by the state that have not yet been used to pay taxes. So we know tax liabilities come first, then comes spending. Let's say in the US, it's last year was four and a half trillion of spending, followed by three and a half trillion of tax payments, which leaves a trillion in reserve accounts, followed by a trillion of treasury securities purchases, which shifts dollars from reserve accounts to securities accounts at the Fed. Okay, so the public debt equals the dollar spent that haven't yet been used to pay taxes. So that's the trillion remaining in the security accounts. Okay, that equals the net financial assets in the uh, economy, in the non-government sector of the economy. I don't include government sector, this one, but it's the non-government sector. Okay, and, that, and that's the only source of net financial assets. The Fed's the monopoly supplier of those, the single supplier of those non-financial assets. Uh, that equals cash plus reserves plus treasury securities outstanding now it also equals total treasury securities but some of those are held by the fed who exchange them for cash and reserves and that equals what is not wrong to be called it's not wrong to call what that equals the net money supply the net financial assets in the private sector which used to be um included in components s and l of monetary aggregates from the fed which you don't hear about anymore Okay, and what we know is, you know, as a further point of logic, 
the Fed can alter the mix of those three, but not the total. So when the Fed buys securities, there are more reserves and fewer securities in the private sector, but the total is the same. When the banks want more cash, there'll be fewer reserves, but more cash or fewer treasury securities and more cash. But the total is going to stay the same. Again, the Fed is the supplier of the single supplier of the net financial aspect. And the thing that I can make the case in theory, but we've also seen in practice over the last 30 years, I suggest is that output, employment, and inflation are not a uh, function of the mix. Quantitative easing uh, reduces the number of treasury securities, increases the number of reserves. It does not alter output, employment, or inflation that I've been able to detect empirically and in the, um, and so I, I call it a placebo because it does have some placebo type of effects, but no actual, there's no actual channel, financial channel, direct financial channel. Okay. So now we talk about unemployment, which is created by design. Uh, oh, let me just go back for a second. So when we talk about monetary financing, which is the topic of this thing, which is why I got to this, we can see that the, the whole concept as it's put forth is kind of not applicable. Monetary financing is about like, is a, answers the question of how does the government get the money to spend? Well, it spends first, and then those funds are directed either towards reserves, cash, or treasury securities. It doesn't come from anywhere. It's just a credit by the Federal Reserve. And Chairman Powell just repeated what Chairman uh, Bernanke told to Scott Pelley at 60 Minutes. Where does the money come from? We use the computer to mark up the numbers in the accounts. It's just data entry is where it comes from. And everything here I'm talking about is accounting, which is after the fact record keeping. Okay. So now we look at unemployment. Unemployment is the evidence that the state has not hired all of the unemployed created by its tax liabilities. The purpose of tax liabilities is to create people looking for paid work Without them, there would be no unemployed as we defined it. There'd be nobody looking for paid work in exchange for the tax credit defined by the tax liability, in this case, the US dollars. And so the, we can say today that the, uh, or you can say that, for example, the tax liability created 10 million unemployed and the government only hired 3 million of them, leaving 7 million unemployed. Also, unemployment is always an unspent income story. Okay, and that goes all the way back to under consumption theory, first written up in 1598 or something like that. But what we're saying is, um, it's again, the identity that uh, GDP equals income equals uh, spending for any ex post, any agent that didn't spend all of his income, some other agent must have spent more than his income or the output would not have been sold. Okay, and, um, and so we have the government uh, spending more, you know, creating a tax liability which creates unemployed. It then spends more than enough for uh, those people to get jobs if all the unspent income was then respent, but it's not. There's a savings desire, there's a desire not to spend income and any unspent income is necessarily offset by those spending more of their income, again, ex post. That can be either private sector deficit spending, borrowing to spend, or the public sector spending, spent expenditures exceeding uh, tax uh, receipts, tax uh, payments. Uh, the two of those to the penny um, is what funds if I could just unspent income. If I could just interrupt for a second. No. Uh, if we're going to be on time, you should be okay. thinking about um, I can stop anywhere and unemployment can always be adjusted. Um, and this is my end note. Budget constraints as well as interest rate determination and interest rate policy applicable to fixed exchange rate policy are not applicable to floating exchange rate policy. That's my issue, my only issue probably with mainstream economics that what they talk about or have been talking about has been applicable to fixed exchange rate policy. What MMT has done is um, provided uh, policy options and, under, and understandings of floating exchange rate policy. And I'll end it there for you. Okay, thank you very much, Warren. So with that, we're going to move on to uh, Nariana Kochilakota.
um, who also has 10, 15 minutes, and then we'll have about 15 minutes discussion at the end. Great. Yeah, thanks, Roger. I think, Warren, if you could uh, stop sharing your screen, that'd be great. Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting me to be part of this uh, webinar, Roger and uh, Megan. It's a uh, uh, real uh, pleasure. And uh, it was a real pleasure to, to listen to Warren uh, talk about the ideas of modern monetary theory. Uh, and so I'm going to talk about modern monetary theory um, really from the perspective of someone who, who is a part, I, I view myself as part of the mainstream and macro. All right, so there's been a lot of interest, increased interest, especially in the policy sphere. And what I'm going to talk about is the main lesson of modern monetary theory. And that is that it, um, the government can expand economic activity using fiscal policy interventions without paying a material macroeconomic cost uh, now or later. And so I think we're gonna, I'm gonna talk about two kinds of crowding out. Um, and I think one um, point for modern monetary theory uh, is that intertemporal crowding out from fiscal expansions is limited. So if you build up a large debt, um, it doesn't in and of itself reduce uh, future economic policies, po possibilities, I should say. And what I'm going to argue is this really doesn't differ that much from uh, what are admittedly pretty ambiguous implications of uh, what, I, I'm, what I'm going to call mainstream macro theory. So the idea here is you have a large debt, uh, like Japan does, for example, that does not limit what you're going to be able to do in the future economically. Um, <clears throat> Now, the other thing I think is true in um, modern monetary theory is there's relatively little intratemporal crowding out associated with fiscal expansions. And it, it, here I'm talking really over the medium run, so it's still a little intertemporal. Um, and this is what I'm gonna argue is very different from the implications of mainstream macro theory. And I think it's here that uh, modern monetary theory is actually winning the battle. MMT is winning this battle, uh, at least right now. Um, it really depends on the data, and uh, I'll, I'll talk about that in a, in a moment. I'll close with a quick, um, I'm gonna be talking about several things I don't really know the, uh, as much about as I'd like to, but uh, I'll say something about politics here as well. Um, I, I think one of the, and you see this in the title of this webinar itself, that um, the excitement about MMT um, is correlated, at least uh, as I read it, with uh, an excitement about policies that are often favored by progressives, Green Revolution, for uh, me, the Green New Deal, for example. And I'm going to close by expressing skepticism about um, this political link. Um, and I, I, and I, I think it's, there, there's limits to how far, how far we should expect that to go. Caveat. I have one caveat here, very important. I'm very much in learning mode with respect to MMT. I hope to be much more knowledgeable at the end of the event than I was in uh, uh, the beginning. I've already learned, uh, I think, a lot from listening to Warren. And uh, the second uh, uh, aspect is that I'm going to represent myself as uh, a representative agent, so to speak, of, of uh, mainstream macro. And that, too, might be a little misleading. <laughs> it's not clear that I... I, I that, Mainstream macro is quite heterogeneous in many respects, and uh, um, I would say I'm part of that big tent, but it is, it is a big tent. So let me talk first about, I'm going to have three points. I'm going to talk about intertemporal crowding out, intratemporal crowding, and then come to politics. So what do I mean by intertemporal crowding out? Now suppose the federal government were to sell a lot of debt to U.S. taxpayers, uh, denominated in dollars. Um, does that debt expansion reduce future economic, acti economic activity. And you'll often hear, and mainly politicians to, to use that language that, yeah, it does, it does uh, um, restrict what we're gonna do for future generations. The language like that is often. Um, the mainstream macro perspective of fiscal policy is quite rich. Um, and, you know, those, those who read Olivier Blanchard's um, presidential address, obviously Olivier, quite a mainstream macro person, uh, talked about one perspective, which I think is a very important one, about what happens if R is less than the growth rate. But so let's suppose the real interest rate is greater than the growth rate. Um, default risk doesn't change that much. Um, and by expanding the debt, we're not driving down the real interest rate. Um, this is, it turns out to be a big assumption as well. Uh, very nice, important, I think, interesting, both interesting and important recent paper by uh, 
Atif Mian and, and uh, uh, co-authors ha has suggested that actually expanding the debt might lead, might be a very good reason why it does lead to a fall in uh, real estate rate. Let's take these assumptions as operational. And, and they would be true in a bunch of different models. I'm not gonna go through, through them, but that's the, that's, uh, in these circumstances, then debt expansion has to translate into higher future surpluses down the road. And the reason people are holding the debt today is because they um, are expecting that there'll be higher future surpluses in the future. It's very similar to the idea that um, if you if the value total value of your shares go up as a corporation, you must be paying higher future dividends. I think that's a useful analogy to be, be coming coming down the, come, uh, to, to keep in mind. And these future sur surpluses could take the form of uh, seniorage. Now, with that said, and, 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 and obviously this gets a lot of attention both in, in, uh, in uh, policy circles and in, 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 uh, in academic circles, this, this implication, but it's really not that meaningful. It's about as meaningful as saying that you expect future dividends. There's just no restriction offered by the theory on when those additional taxes need to be collected. It could be at any time, often in the indefinite future. And here is, a, I think, a very that as long as the new debt that you've issued, the expansion, is held by taxpayers, there's really no affordability limit associated with that debt. And what I mean by that is you can always pay off that debt by, by uh, extinguishing uh, tax obligations. That's essentially what um, um, is, is being done here. You collect the debt from people, and that says, oh, that is a way of paying off taxes. That's a way to extinguish tax obligations. So it's basically, you're, you can always tax away the debt you've issued as long as it's held by people that you can tax. So there's really no affordability limit associated with, uh, can, you, can you afford to pay off a new debt? Well, you can always tax it away. So of course you can, you can afford it. The real question about interterm from crowding out is really all about the nature of taxation. How distortionary are taxes? And you'll see a number of papers in ma ma mainstream macro, all taxes are lump sum. So then they're completely non-distortionary and then you really should have uh, uh, this the neutrality built in that there's not much, there's, you can have a lot of debt and not expect any, any decline in future output because that, that huge amount of debt is not imposing uh, distortions in the, in, the, in the creation of, of new output. Um, this is the key question. And my reading of the literature, and you know, it's one person's reading, uh, these distortionary effects could, could be small or large, it depends on the exact nature of the tax system, how it will look in the future, and many very hard to measure elasticities. And you'll see people who are sort of, you know, quote unquote mainstream will end up arguing about exactly how distortionary we should expect these taxes to be, especially if they're way off in the, in the far distant future. So my punchline from this is intertemporal crowding out just doesn't seem like a key implication of mainstream macro. So the idea that, boy, if we have a, a debt to GDP ratio of one and a half, that's gonna be much worse for the future um, of the economy than if we have a debt to GDP of 0.9, that doesn't seem like a key, uh, at least theoretical implication. And my reading the empirical literature is, it's, been, it's very difficult to sort this out as well uh, from, from the empirics. So let me move to my second point, which is about intra-temporal crowding out. And the main thing that's going on in mainstream macro and, and is, is in the medium run. And when I'm talking about medium run, I'll say three years, Say's law operates. Um, you know, there are those in mainstream macro who will say Say's law operates in, in a matter of weeks. Um, but I think there's a general agreement that over a three-year period, Price, the price and wage adjustment process operates so that demand has to adjust to be equal to supply. And that means that aggregate demand stimulus really can't affect output after that price and wage adjustment is complete. It can only lead to higher inflation. Okay, so demand, if you try to stimulate the economy, you can uh, switch the composition of output, certainly if you have more soldiers, to use Warren's example, uh, that's going to mean less for the private sector, 
and uh, it's going to lead to more inflation, but you're not going to be able to expand the pie using aggregate demand stimulus. In this sense, um, at least over the medium run, and you know, there's some ambiguity about what the medium run is, uh, the Phillips curve is viewed as being, being very steeply sloped, if not actually vertical. Now, my reading of uh, MMT, and uh, you know, certainly this is something I'm hoping to learn more about, but uh, uh, MMT offers a very different perspective. You just don't have this automatic market adjustment of prices and wages to equate demand and supply, even over relatively long periods of time. Once you take this view, then aggregate demand stimulus can have medium run or even longer effects on output without having much in the way of effects on inflation. You're not pinned down to a very steep uh, view of the Phillips curve, in, even over the medium run. Now, this is where I think MMT is winning uh, on the empirical front. Uh, I think over the past 25 years, um, probably you could go back even further, Inflation has just been largely insensitive to, to real economic conditions. It's been very difficult to, people talk about the Phillips curve being broken, whatever language you want to use. The Phillips curve doesn't really seem to be close to vertical, even over a three year period. And I, I think we could go much longer than that. So this, is a, this means that aggregate demand stimulus can give rise to activity um, without inflationary costs. And this is something that, uh, yeah, people in, in mainstream macro will think, well, this, this can work over, a sh a relative, over the short run, um, but it can't work over the medium to longer run. And that is where I think um, you, you, we're able to think about doing aggregate demand stimulus without worrying about inflationary, inflationary costs or crowding out um, in, in an intertemporal way that because we can actually expand the pot without um, bearing an inflationary burden. So that was, those are my two points. Uh, intertemporal crowding out, actually, you know, mainstream macro doesn't say that much, but intertemporal crowding out, in my view. On the intratemporal crowding out point, um, you know, the, the, the creation of inflation as opposed to output through stimulus, that I think there's a lot more agreement on. Um, and, but here, and I think here MIT is, is, is more consistent with the facts. So I, I think there's a sense in which MMT is, is winning the intellectual battle. There's a, a growing appreciation um, that there may be relatively little cost to large fiscal policy interventions. Um, but let me offer a, a, pl a political caution. Uh, I think many proponents of MMT think that this victory is gonna lead to the adoption of progressive agenda items like, like the Green New Deal. Um, I don't see that as being automatic by any means. Um, I, you know, my own view of the, the worries about debt, um, uh, they're waived. So when, when you come forward and say, I'd like to have a progressive uh, gen item that cut my cost a lot, uh, people immediately talk uh, about, boy, that could just gonna cost a lot, that's gonna be difficult to afford, we might have a big debt and a deficit as a result of that. And you don't hear those same concerns offered when you know, doing tax cuts for corporations or high-end income earners. So I don't think the debate is really about um, is MMT correct or not. I think the debate is really about do we want to have tax cuts for big corporations um, and high-end income earners or do we want to have the Green New Deal? And I think that's where at the end of the day, I think that's where the battle has, the political battle has to be, has to be fought. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Nayana. Um, we, we're going to extend this by about five minutes, I think, because of the, uh, the interruption. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity uh, to do two things. One of all, uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, just comment myself on, particularly initially on what Narayana has said, and then I'd like to pose a question to see if I can get uh, some discussion going between the two of you. Um, I, I wrote a paper uh, a while ago called Post-Keynesian Dynamic Stochastic General Equilibrium Theory, which was an attempt to try to um, draw together uh, ideas from um, mainstream economics and, and post-Keynesians. And this is very much related to Narayana's point about what he calls intratemporal um, crowding out. And I'm very much on board with, um, with Narayana on that point. And, and while I'm plugging books, I'd like to plug my own, which was Prosperity for All, which came out a couple of years ago, uh, which makes that point. Now I'm going to get to the question. 
uh, when Warren uh, gave his discussion, Warren appeared to think that there really was not that much difference between what he was saying and the mainstream when it came to closed economies. Uh, I'm hearing from Mariana, I think I'd probably say that's correct. But Warren appears to think that the big difference between what he's saying um, and what more mainstream theory is about is about open economies. And I wonder if I could ask Warren just to rephrase that in a few uh, couple of sentences and see if Narayana would, um, would respond. Warren, you're muted. I think if you just press the Hi. space button, yeah. Yeah, okay. So my distinction was between fixed exchange rate policy and floating exchange rate, not open or closed, which okay. is a different distinction, number one. Number two, let's just show you a big difference. When they say pay off the debt, if you've got the sequence correct, you recognize that it's not an applicable concept because what happens on the 15th of the month when treasury securities mature? The Fed debits the securities accounts of the holder and credits the reserve account. So maybe JP Morgan had money, you know, had treasury bonds in what's called, a, which, are, which are dollars in a, what's called a securities account at the Fed of a billion dollars and they debit that account, it goes to zero, and then they credit their reserve account for a billion. But that's paying off the debt. They're taking the same dollars, same number of dollars and shifting them from a securities account to a reserve account. That's not like an economic event, all right? And that's because the sequ of what I said was sequence. You know, they spend first and then taxes get paid. They spend first and then securities get purchased. So how can there be, how is crowding out, financial crowding out, I know real crowding out is applicable, but financial crowding out when you're spending first into an economy that's looking to get your money to be able to pay taxes and to save. How could, what, the Warren, can I just jump in there because there was a question that came up um, yeah. earlier from one of the uh, yeah. participants, from one of the audience. And I think, um, could you just be, be more specific about what yeah. you mean between financial and real? Um, yeah. because in some ways, uh, in mainstream economics, we use financial uh, to refer. I, I think there's a confusion potentially. In, yeah. So in if, you know, if, if, the, if the state, the government goes in to buy all the butter, they've crowded us out and we can't have any butter on our bread. <laughs> That's real crowding out. If they come in to spend dollars and spend them, they haven't crowded out so any the difference dollars is, or is, borrowing or anything like that. I see. So, the, so the, the difference is, is between yeah. what it's spent on or? Well, um, the presumption is that the government has to borrow first to get money. And if you borrow first, now there's less for somebody else. So you're crowding out the market for borrowing. Well, there's no, that's not an applicable concept. It's backwards. You know, it's a loans create deposits world. The causation goes from loans to deposits. So financial for you mean, means dollar denominated? Nominal, yeah, nominal, financial, purely nominal. Yes, dollar denominated, exactly. And you say, well, future, there's assumption of future higher taxes, why? We're talking about the outstanding money supply is, are the dollars in treasury securities and securities accounts. Why does the size of the money supply growing imply future taxes to reduce the money supply in the future? I mean, you might wanna do that, but it's not, growing economy has a growing money supply for all kinds of reasons. Why is it assumption that that money supply has to go to zero? You know, it's, it's just not applicable. And then the Phillips curve, look, the first week of game theory, you learn that the labor market's not a fair game. People have to work to eat and business only hires if it likes the return on equity prospects. And so anytime you don't have a fair game, you're going to see, uh, you know, declining real returns towards subsistence levels of, of the guy who's at the bad end of that stick. And, um, and, and so, look, even if you're the last guy who doesn't have a job, your bargaining power is not any higher because if you don't take the next job, you can't feed your family. So that's why even at the margin, we're not seeing the presumed of, you know, channels that a Phillips curve would operate through. And to me, it's just a faulty assumption from the beginning that violates mainstream zone game theory. So again, I, I've got a lot of issues with the mainstream assumptions that are going into these models. Nariana, do you want to respond? Uh, well, there's a lot to respond there. Um, I, you know, I think that on the on the debt front, um, 
I, this is why I try to focus more on what I see as the policy implications and, and try to get into what a view is, view is, is the, the conflict there. Um, you know, I, I, on the, on the uh, you know, on the theory part, um, I don't think there's really that much difference. It's I think it's important then to formulate where are we coming down? Why are we coming down on the differences in terms of, of policy? And, uh, you know, I think, I think we don't have as good an understanding of how inflation dynamics work, um, where, what, what, where, where, what drives inflation. Um, I think that people came out of the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s with a feeling, boy, we've got a handle on this. And the last 25 years has been very tough on that, on that presumption. So, I, um, so that's on the, on the Phillips curve part. On the, on the debt part, look, I, you know, I'll use my language. What you're describing is very similar to, to uh, views of Ricardian equivalence. Um, I think the view is that if it really, I think really comes down to if you were going to have higher surpluses in the future, um, let me try to, let me back this up. The basic idea is that a piece of paper issued by the government, if you say it's going to be paid off by another piece of paper by issued the government, and that's going to be paid off by yet another piece of paper issued by the government, there's a whole sequence of, of pricing relationships that have to be hold. And then the question is, what is true at the very end of the pricing? I, actually, I don't find that that interesting question. It turns out in, when people write down modern macro models, that is everything. <laughs> and so it's that, that last uh, term that really matters a lot. And it's, it's at that last term that where you have to, you have to say, oh, okay, we've got to, that's, uh, that's got to go to zero. That's when, that's what people usually assume. And that, to get that to go to zero, you have to get, you have to end up taxing away um, the, the debt you originally issued. All, the very end of time is a long ways off. So I don't think this is really that interesting a discussion, frankly. I think the interesting conversation is much more about the Phillips curve. And um, you've offered one model of how labor markets work. Um, I can I can bring in a lot of labor economists who would disagree with that model. That's why the data wins, in my view. I, I actually find the theoretical, I'm a theorist, I don't find the theoretical discussions that interesting. The, the data is where the, the argument is being won, I think, by MMT. And, as long as the Phillips curve remains as flat as it does, I think the MMT remains a, a, a useful guide to thinking about what we should be doing in the policy dimension. Well, I, I'm uh, going to throw something in here as, as a moderator, which is that um, ev everything you've talked about, Narayana, in terms of mainstream, in, is based on um, a, 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 an infinite horizon representative agent structure. Uh, and I know we have Larry Kotlikoff listening in on this, and I know he's going to be talking later. Uh, and I, um, I, I hope that he'll be saying something about the perspective that comes from overlapping generations models. So there is a very heterogeneous mainstream, Warren, um, as Narayana pointed out. And some of them, even on the intertemporal structure, are much um, more consistent with, um, with uh, modern monetary theory in, in that regard. So I, having said that, I'll pass that back to Warren. Yeah, so number one, I completely agree with the policy implications that you're saying. You know, I see it happening. And I, so we have, I, have, I personally have no disagreement with you there at all. And the way it's going, we're more likely to be getting corporate tax cuts than new green, de uh, green New Deal. But not that it's my preference, but that's how I see it going. Uh, look, does anybody, does the mainstream assume all bank loans will get you know, the outstanding money supply created by bank loans will go to zero at some point? No, you know, it, it's, it's the same thing. We're talking about the money supply, okay? The components come from uh, deficit spending, public or private. And the, the idea that this grows as the economy grows, and I guess if the economy shrank to one person, it would all wind down to no bank debt, no bank deposits, and no net government spending, but it's, Again, we're they're looking at it through the wrong end of the telescope. This and the like, the main contribution here is sequence. The, the funds to pay taxes come from the government. It's not how the government has to get money to pay the debt. The government has spent the money first, and then offered the debt, treasury securities, as an alternative to reserves. And you can see it in Fed operations, and that's why. People in the Fed, I guess, you know, Jim Klaus is still there. Maybe you know him. You can talk to him about it. 
nope, they all see this as self-evident. And, and it's just a question of how a spreadsheet works. There's no theory here or anything else. And yet the mainstream is carrying these assumptions that violate the operations of this spreadsheet we call the monetary system. And I, I guess I'll leave it at that for now. Okay, that's excellent. So uh, there have been quite a few questions coming in, but I think uh, it, it's going to be best if we leave those questions for the last hour um, and the, the back and forth discussions will be mainly, I think, between, uh, between the participants. So um, we're, we're running a little bit over schedule, but not too much. So uh, at this point, I'd like to say thank you so much, Warren and Mariana. Please hang around for the um, debate at the end. And I'm going to pass this over to Megan, if Megan is here. Megan? Yes. Hi, thanks for that. Um, I wanted to introduce our second panel's panelists. Um, we've got Anne Pettifor and Vitor Constancio, and we're going to discuss MMT, but within the context of a Green New Deal, which came up at the end of the last panel. Um, so first to introduce Anne. Anne's the Director of Policy Research uh, in Macroeconomics, or PRIME. She's a member of the Green New Deal of economists and environmentalists and entrepreneurs as well. Um, she's written really extensively on sovereign debt restructurings and sustainable development. And um, to plug another book, last year published a book called The Case for the Green New Deal. Uh, and then Vitor Constancio is a professor at the School of Economics and Business Administration at the University of Navarra. And of course, he was previously the vice president of the ECB, so might have some views on how central banks could engage with the Green New Deal um, and was governor at the central bank in Portugal. So without further ado, I'm going to invite Anne to give her comments first and then we'll have Vitor. Thank you very much, Megan, and thank you to Roger and Angus for including me. This is really a very important and uh, important discussion and I'm delighted to be here. So first of all, I want to say about MMT that uh, it's done a lot of good work in explaining a, the nature of money, and the role of central banks in, um, in the system. And, um, and that is to be commended because there was a great deal of ignorance that, you know, I, 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 there's been a great deal of, there is a great deal of public ignorance about the way the system works. And so as a result, the system often works against the public interest. But for me, modern monetary theory is neither modern nor is it properly a theory. And I, I want to say, this. Um, I'm a great fan of John Law, who back in 1705 in his book on money explained the nature of money. And in the words of Joseph Schumpeter, he is fact, and Joseph Schumpeter wrote this in 1950, uh, John Law is in the front ranks of the monetary theorists of all time. So we've known and understood the nature of money you know, since seven, at least seven, or since the, the founding of the Bank of England in 1694, but that is knowledge that is gained and lost periodically. Um, and, you know, for me, the reason it is lost is because of the interests that money serves on the whole. So for me, you know, MMT is not modern, and I don't believe that it's actually a theory either, because it doesn't deal, in my view, properly with the nature of the theory of, uh, of the nature of interest. And interest for me is incredibly important in, um, in discussing the economy, mainly because the rate of interest has such an impact on innovation, on uh, entrepreneurship, on the ability of, of companies to make profits, to borrow money, to invest, to innovate, to make a profit and repay their debts. So, so for me, the rate of interest, not just the bank rate, but the rate across the spectrum is of extraordinary importance to the to the health of the economy. But even more importantly, it is of importance to the ecosystem. Because if the rate of interest, the real rate of interest, the interest paid by people in the real economy, not just the central bank rate of interest, uh, if that interest is high in real terms, it requires the extraction of assets. It, it requires the extraction of, on the one hand, human assets, physical assets, labor, but importantly, it requires the extraction of ecological assets to repay the debt. And I think of Brazil having to strip forests in order to raise hard currency to repay foreign debts. 
And the key, the key thing about interest is that it's subject to the law of mathematics. Um, as Fred Soddy once explained, uh, it grows by a certain rate of interest and by the law of simple and compound interest. The ecosystem, by contrast, is subject to the law, laws of physics and in particular to the second law of thermodynamics. And so the clash between this mathematical and compounding rate of interest and the, uh, the nature of the ecosystem is for me a really, really important um, problem for us to discuss and to manage. And I don't believe that MMT uh, thinks about that seriously enough. So for me, MMT in a sense strengthens the obsession that we have, especially here in Britain since George Osborne, with uh, the uh, idea of the government as household. Um, and I know that the MMTers will be alarmed by me saying that, but this emphasis on deficits and on the, on the virtue of rising deficits kind of plays into the um, discourse about the importance of the public uh, finances. And what it plays down, and I've noticed this in Warren's uh, contribution, is it plays down what is going on in the real economy. The emphasis is on, you know, what is being done at the level of the state and not on the on what is happening in the real economy. And for me, the rising deficit is not a, a, a matter of, is not a virtuous thing. It's a reflection of the weakness of the real economy. Once the real economy prospers and is stabilized, the budget deficit falls as night follows day. And the failure of MMT to understand that and to focus obsessively on the deficit and say that, again, you know, it's possible for the deficit to rise uh, almost exponentially, I think just misunderstands the real nature of the economy. And it means we don't deal with the economy. So, for me, the rising deficit is an evidence is evidence of failure. It may be uh, an evidence of excess financial activity in the economy, but it's not a consequence of economic excess. So by deploying what I think are essentially accounting methods for analyzing the economy, MMT is playing into this household budget parallel. Instead, in my view, and contrary to say the view of Osborne, we should be looking at why bu budgets are unbalanced and we should be looking at the real economy itself. But for me, perhaps the biggest problem with MMT is that it places uh, undue emphasis on monetary financing and it does that on top of the existing economic model. You know, this, the, the point that Warren made about, you know, this, uh, floating interest rates and about uh, his, al his alignment with, with the mainstream economics on the question of closed versus open economy or be between floating and fixed uh, exchange rates. So for me, the real problem <laughs> is not the deficit. The real problem is not monetary financing. The real problem is the economic model. And we've done nothing uh, to do to 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 we've done nothing to transform the existing economic model the existing economic model which led to the great financial crisis of 2007 9 has not been transformed or reformed even it's been tinkered with at the edges but it's exactly the same model and as such it's not solving the problem basically that we face or the problems that we face and that is where in my view, the Green New Deal differs from MMT because the Green New Deal calls for structural change to the economic model, to the economic model of financialized globalization, to an economic model which places the interests of finance, if you like, over the interests of the real economy, which fails to subordinate the financial sector to the interests of the real economy. And that's why I think the GND is far more radical. And it's modeled on Roosevelt's um, New Deal. And uh, I want to refer here to the work of Eric Rochway, who has revealed exactly how radical Roosevelt was. I mean, he, he's remembered in terms of, you know, government spending, but actually on the night of his inauguration, 
Roosevelt began to dismantle the global financial system, which at the time was based on the gold standard. He, he demanded that the banks hand over their gold and he wanted to do it that night and his advisors told him they could, he couldn't, he had to wait until Monday. So he closed the banks on the Monday and he demanded they hand over their gold. That began the process of dismantling the, uh, global, uh, agree, uh, the, glo the gold standard. And on the basis of that dismantling, and then he hired um, a, a mariner to uh, Mariner Eccles as his uh, governor of the central of the Federal Reserve, and, Marin, uh, and Mariner Eccles gradually shifted power away from the New Fort York Fed to Washington. Central bankers became less important under the New Deal than they were pre-New Deal, and that than they were post. 1971 and the dismantling of the Bretton Woods system. What has happened since 1971 is that central banks have become all powerful. Jerome Powell today, and I'm particularly bitter about this as someone who was born in South Africa and who has family in South Africa, today Jerome Powell effectively governs the global economy, decides on the value of the South African exchange rate, decides on where the capital can freely move from South Africa to New York uh, um, without hindrance, without any friction whatsoever, at a time of crisis when South Africa is facing a plague. Those decisions, and then decides whether or not South Africa should um, have access to dollars through swap lines. This is an enormous power that we've now situated in technocratic civil servants at central banks. The great thing about Roosevelt was he diminished the power of the government of the Federal Reserve. That changed quickly after he left, after he, um, he died, because of course Wall Street insisted on, on, on uh, having a different model. So, so my concern is that if we are to tackle the coming crisis of climate breakdown, ecosystem bre breakdown, and it's not coming, it's happening as we speak in Bangladesh, then it is going to be necessary to claim uh, to, to transform to structurally change the current economic model. MMT is not asking for that, and that's why I prefer to promote the Green New Deal, and um, and uh, why I want to argue that unless we do think in those terms, we're not going to be able to adjust the economy in order to deal with the coming threat. I think I'll stop there. Great, thank you, Vitor. Can we hear from you now? So thank you, uh, Roger and Megan, for having me uh, in this uh, uh, discussion. Well, I presume that the subject came up because central banks are now doing a lot of extraordinary things, uh, expanding their balance sheets, their monetary base, and so on. And uh, so this could be seen as a sort of uh, arbinger of uh, using these things and uh, the MMT approach to finance, among other things, the uh, Green New Deal. Uh, I won't lose too much time in explaining uh, what I have there, just very briefly, what the central banks are doing is not uh, monetary financing, is not helicopter money in uh, my concept, is not even uh, real monetization of public debt and total permanent fiscal dominance, and certainly it's not MMT, because precisely, it's not permanent uh, monetary financing, as I understand it, uh, nor permanent fiscal dominance. But there is a lot of collaboration with treasuries, uh, and the central banks nevertheless still have cover under their legal mandates to uh, justify what uh, they are doing. But uh, it is also true that they are facilitating the placing of uh, public debt, and also, of course, slightly reducing the market yields of that debt. So MMT could really change the, uh, the whole thing uh, and allow much uh, uh, wider fiscal space. Well, uh, as Anne said, MMT uh, is a misnomer as uh, uh, Stephanie herself said a while ago, because it's not theoretical, it's, it's descriptive mainly. And it's not modern because it can be found in Knapp, Keynes, Lerner, and I could add Minsky and Godley would uh, that also contribute to the MMT approach. So what is it? 
is first a charter list concept of money, money as a state creation. Uh, money is in endogenous to the economy, uh, and there is no multiplier, but a sort of divisor, as Goodhart has uh, said many, many years ago. And this is an idea that it is shared by most central bankers I know. So uh, it's a correct view of money uh, and how it is created. It's also a description of a fiat money economy where the state in a monetary sovereign country does not face a, a lack of money to spend. No financial constraint. But the features of a monetary sovereign country are, first, it shows the fiat money, uh, which is needed not only because of uh, tax payments, but uh, for other convenience reasons, adopts a floating exchange rate and has no significant external debt in foreign currencies or its money, it's accepted internationally, uh, which this concept of what is monetary sovereignty fully applies only then for strong countries with strong uh, currencies or strong for other reasons. MMT then also is about giving fiscal policy complete dominant position um, as a stabi macro stabilization tool. And it's directed, of course, to guarantee full employment as it was proposed by Lerner in its uh, functional finance in the 1940s. And to this, the MMT adds the job guarantee program proposed by uh, Minsky. Lerner, of course, pointed to limits of what could be done uh, with deficits and debt, but the limit comes from inflation when it starts, and inflation is seen uh, uh, by Lerner uh, and MMT uh, on its dependent on the pressure of demand and supply for real resources. Uh, that's where uh, then the pressure for price increases may uh, emerge. So the inflation is the constraint uh, that policy has to recognize uh, and has to tax or reduce expenditures if inflation is coming, uh, not really uh, a financing one. Um, uh, and fiscal policy is then in charge of both full employment and inflation. Um, and then it's to balance the economy, so uh, to guarantee full employment and control of inflation. These views uh, of uh, uh, inflation and real resources have nothing to do, of course, with the, the uh, views of uh, uh, vertical uh, supply curves in a few years' time. It has nothing to do with uh, natural rates of unemployment or such uh, concepts. And uh, uh, speaking in the perspective of what Narayana uh, um, said about the intra uh, uh, temporal uh, choice, uh, of course, MMT uh, rejects uh, all that, as many real Keynesians and post-Keynesians. It's not, uh, you know, specific to MMT. Roger refuses the uh, Nauru concept, uh, as I do, and many other uh, uh, post-Keynesian economists. Uh, and the idea, of course, is that there is really no distinction in historical time between the short term and the medium term. And the link is through hysteresis in the labor market and through investment in creating uh, productive capacity. So uh, vertical things in three or four years time uh, as a sort of natural law uh, do not uh, exist. So Lerner, uh, I, I put there some quotes uh, from him. I am not, not going to read them just to highlight that, of course, he says that to uh, uh, oppose the prejudices that exists, his words, about deficits and debt, it has to be first uh, recognized that domestic debt, national debt, is relatively unimportant because the interest on the debt is not a burden on the nation. There is indeed no burden to future generations of domestic debt because it's just a transfer. Uh, which occurs uh, when this debt is paid in the way it exists. So the nation cannot be made bankrupt by internally held debt. It's different, of course, with external debt, particularly potentially in uh, foreign currencies, 
um, if the country has no full monetary sovereign, sovereignty. And the purpose of taxation, said Lerner already, is never to raise money, but to leave less money in the hands of the taxpayer. The purpose of borrowing is not to raise money, but make the public hold more bonds and less money, and as is said in other places, is to allow the central bank to influence interest, market interest rates and therefore private investment. So MMT explores these ideas and the two main points are the one, these two ones, which are widely shared. A country with monetary sovereignty never defaults. Well, Greenspan said it in 2011. Uh, Powell said it uh, three days ago. Uh, so it's a sort of trivial description. Also, taxes and borrowing are not necessary to fund state expenditures. Uh, as Mankiw also admitted in his uh, uh, American Economic Review piece uh, this month, uh, government can pay public expenditures by having the central bank crediting the accounts the banks have with it. The condition, the condition that the government must have beforehand enough money in its central bank account is just a man-made rule or prejudice, a learner would say, uh, but of course the actual operation of paying by creating money and increasing the monetary base is the same either way, as Warren also uh, uh, highlighted. But from these two trivial descriptive, I would say, ideas, MMD then, uh, uh, MMT then assumed that fiscal policy would be in charge of everything, as the learner did, and that monetary policy uh, is not efficient, and it uh, should be totally dominated, accepting permanent monetary financing and having, having the only mission of ensuring very low, if not zero, as uh, Randall Ray has uh, proposed many times, uh, zero interest rate. And for this goal, of course, uh, treasury bonds has, have to be issued to allow the central bank to make uh, open market operations. So, um, uh, what uh, this uh, then uh, implies, uh, what, uh, what uh, uh, indeed makes uh, uh, MMT, uh, say, attractive, for uh, many people is the stress it puts on the ideas that monetary sovereign countries are never financially or monetarily constrained, never. They can always pay. Governments don't have to find money uh, beforehand via taxes or borrowing to pay for new uh, expenditures. It's the other way around, as Warren uh, uh, mentioned, or it leads to the same thing, it's money creation. And as uh, Stephanie even once uh, uh, wrote, uh, in uh, 2019, uh, perhaps even low taxes for the rich are possible uh, because then, uh, of course, the wealthy are victims of their own propaganda because to escape higher taxes, they must embrace deficits. Uh, and uh, uh, consider if applying then uh, this idea, uh, we can expand many nice programs without treating the super rich as our piggy bank. But of course, at the same time, all MMT uh, scholars um, also adopt the concept of the limitations, the limits that Lerner already had. And there are many statements uh, about those limitations by them. For instance, from Stephanie again, uh, a, new, a, new, a Green New Deal that aims to spend trillions transforming the entire US economy into a fossil free zone, uh, then all bets are off. There is almost certainly no way to avoid an inflationary meltdown without some offsets. And in the same way, there is this uh, uh, 2019 paper by Randall Ray and Narcissian uh, going in the same direction. So what, in my view, are some, some shortcomings and limitations of MMT already hinting that many of the ideas, um, particularly this, the descriptive ones, are uh, really uh, correct. Well, in my view, it is wrong to dismiss completely the stabilization role of monetary policy, uh, even admitting, as I do, that history shows that uh, the effects of monetary policy are asymmetric. Uh, monetary policy is much more effic e efficient to control inflation than to push economies out of recessions. Second, fiscal policy is a difficult tool to control inflation and that should be recognized. Uh, 
difficulties in getting parliament approvals for tax increases or big expenditure cuts when it is needed uh, and slow procedures. Third, monetary policy cannot guarantee full control of long-term market yields uh, for sovereign bonds. And so uh, um, that's not uh, indeed uh, completely possible because they depend on many other uh, variables. Fourth, keeping monetary policy rates always very low or even zero may lead to credit booms, excessive private expenditures with inflationary consequences that would make the task of uh, fiscal policy to control inflation even more difficult. And by the way, here there is a hidden uh, uh, issue because inflation being then related to the use of real uh, resources uh, in discussing any policy, MMT or another one, there is always the choice between having more public expenditure and therefore less private expenditure. And this threshold as is a political choice uh, that cannot be evaded. And sometimes MMT uh, you know, hints uh, or say things that uh, seem to indicate that, yeah, it, we, we can pay so we can expand the public sector with no consequences and then we raise taxes if inflation emerges. There are difficult political choices there. Finally, floating exchange rates do not guarantee zero current account balances. And a consistent policy of low interest rates could put pressure on the exchange rate, even in floating exchange rates uh, and uh, or capital flight. Uh, and then these two things to contain credit booms or pressure on exchange rate could require then real uh, regulatory uh, changes introducing quantitative uh, limits to what banks do or uh, introduce capital controls. So MMT as a whole implies a, ra a radical new institutional and regulatory regime that uh, then requires a comprehensive implementation to really work well. But it has many positive points. Uh, it adopts a correct view of money and money creation, correctly helps debunking many an anti-Keynesian incorrect views about fiscal policy, uh, and therefore supports the uh, need for fiscal policy as a macro stabilization tool. MMT helps to demystify wrong views about deficits and that, many of them, that's uh, helpful, uh, but it's not exclusive, of course, to uh, MMT. MMT also helps to expand the boundary of fiscal space, which encourages the adoption of bold, bold public policies and encourages uh, the adoption of temporary monetary financing in extraordinary situations, uh, as it has been proposed by uh, even many mainstream uh, economists or formal uh, central uh, bankers. The problems uh, with MMT lie with the extreme assignment of tasks to fiscal and monetary policies, the insufficient consideration, in my view, of financial system complexities, and this creation of a feeling of excessive facility in expanding fiscal space that uh, may undermine the credibility of proper Keynesian and post-Keynesian approaches to policy. Conclusions. So after the big increase in public debt that uh, results from facing the crisis right now, it will be more difficult uh, to get approval for new big public projects like the, the Green New Deal and others. MMT does not offer an easy panacea to overcome this problem. As its proponents themselves recognize, such a project would require offsetting taxes and expenditure cuts, both to contain inflation and to reorient real resources to new uses, as the paper by Randall Ray uh, illustrates, uh, applying the approach that Keynes took in the book, uh, How to Pay for the War. Um, with monetary financing, MMT, of course, would expand the fiscal space until real inflation risk would uh, emerge. But it requires really a big institutional and regulatory change, which politically will be difficult to, to obtain. So my prediction uh, to conclude is that regarding the future of the macroeconomic policy mix, uh, the pressure of events uh, and system failures as the ones we have uh, been seeing, will lead to more episodes like the current one, 
of monetary and fiscal authorities collaboration and even temporary occurrences of monetary financing. And I finish here. Great, thank you. And you had highlighted that the, the big problem is we haven't changed our macroeconomic model as a result of all of this and that the, we're still subordinating the interests of the planet to the interests of the banks. And I guess I wonder why MMT isn't a way to actually go ahead and um, create money and funnel it exactly where we need it. Is MMT not an opportunity to have the best of both worlds? And also as a kind of a follow-up to that question, is part of the problem that we just think we need growth all the time? So that's for Anne. You might be on mute. I can't see you now. Oh, yeah. great. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. And Anne, you're on mute still. Oh, sorry. Okay. There you go. Right. Sorry. Thank you, Megan. Um, you know, for me, the question isn't creating money. The question is creating economic activity. Um, you know, we, we, <laughs> We have, and, and MMT is recognize this, we have resources out there which are underused. You know, quite right now, we have masses of unemployment. We have so much work to do uh, to tackle the climate. There's so much to be done and so little done, basically. We have to transform our energy systems, our land use systems, and our transport systems. A huge amount of work. Now, the, the real problem isn't, in my view, creating the money for that, that can be done. And that can be done, by the way, that's done by the private sector as much as by the, the, the state, basically. In fact, I, I think mo the, the majority of money supply is created in the real economy. It isn't created at the central bank. I disagree with that. So, but the point is, that is the work that has to be done. And if we could engage in that work, we really wouldn't have to I don't know, it doesn't have to be monetary financed, it seems to be. I mean, basically, maybe I'm not being very clear here, but but the 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 finance that we need comes in, I mean, as I, as I understand it, credit is, is created when someone applies for a loan to undertake some activity. That activity creates employment, generates income, including tax income, which repays the borrowing, basically. That's how things work. Now, if we're creating money and credit, but there aren't people working and creating employment and generating income, then, then at no, no, no amount of credit money creation is going to solve our problem. So, um, so for me, it's the emphasis, the overemphasis on money creation instead of thinking about restoring the economy um, and the restoring economic activity is, is our problem here. We've got to, a lot to do and we're not talking about that. We're talking about what a central bank does. And to quote Mervyn King, you know, the, the, the Bank of England is responsible for just not, about 5% of the money supply. That changes, of course, in a crisis, but not very much more. You know, 95% of the money supply is created by companies applying for loans because they want to build a wind farm or undertake some activity. If they don't want to, if, they, if the economy is so unstable, if the deficit is high, if there's general lack of confidence in the economy, they don't apply for loans. They don't undertake that risky activity. They don't undertake innovation. Things close down. For me, that's where we have to put the emphasis. We have to put the... Now, on the question of growth, Megan, the, the concept of growth was invented effectively by the OEC and Samuel Britton in the late 1960s when they set a growth rate for the British economy of something like 50% over 10 years. And boy, did that in create inflation, right? It massively created. It was... A, so what... I, and I believe, and I don't have evidence of this, I believe the... The motivation for that was that it was possible to grow exponentially in financial terms, mainly thanks to the magic of compound interest, right? But it's not possible to grow exponentially the real economy. And what the OECD was trying to do was to get the real economy to compete with the financial economy. And as a result, at a time of full employment, 
the OEC demanded a growth rate of 50% over 10 years. That was crazy, led to high levels of inflation. And of course, the labor movement, the unions were blamed, right? And the OECD has never really uh, been held to account for that. So, so I don't like the term growth because it implies something that is exponential. Um, what I think is really important is that we should have in full employment. We should have economic activity. We should have investment, high levels of investment. We should have, and, and that has to be undertaken within the constraints of this physically bounded ecosystem. We can't, we can't expand the, the ecosystem any more than it is as it is. You know, the atmosphere is finite, our yeah. resources are finite, and the financial system doesn't recognize finitude. Yeah. So, so I don't want us to talk about growth, but I think rather we should be talking about economic activity and in particular employment. And employment, as I said, is so important for generating income for repaying borrowing. Yeah. Okay, um, Vitor, I've got a question for you because Anne had said in her remarks that, you know, Jay Powell is basically running the world. And one of your, your actual final conclusion was that you think the way forward is for central banks and fiscal authorities to actually coordinate a lot more, if I'm not mistaken. And as a former central banker then, are you getting hives listening to this? I mean, do you think it's right that fiscal authorities should take a bigger role. Um, do you think it's a problem that Jay Powell's running the global economy, so to speak? What's your view on that, given your, your experience? Two things. First, I don't think that uh, uh, Jay Powell is running the world economy uh, in such a fine-tuning way as Anne described. Um, of course, the U.S. and U.S. monetary policy, in view of the dominant role of the dollar, in the international monetary system has a huge influence uh, uh, in the world. That's, uh, you know, undoubtable. But uh, countries still have choices uh, about uh, the degree of capital controls they apply, the type of uh, exchange rate regime they adopt, uh, and all of that. So uh, it's not, uh, you know, really uh, uh, fine-tuning the world economy uh, in that sense. But of course, huge, huge uh, uh, importance because there are always huge spillovers of uh, what the Fed, uh, what the Fed uh, does. Regarding the collaboration, well, what I concluded was that in my prediction, there will be other episodes in the future of this type of collaboration. I don't think it will uh, come to a sort of permanent, uh, um, permanent uh, uh, collaboration. And I uh, also underline that in what is going on now, uh, it is true that there is this collaboration, particularly in the US, with the, uh, the Treasury providing uh, these uh, first loss guarantee in terms of equity to uh, the programs that the Fed is then applying in lending. Um, providing then a huge multiplier of what the Fed can do uh, with the uh, $450 billion that it gets from the Treasury, uh, as Jay Powell said, can have uh, programs up to $4 trillion uh, because of that. So that's the sort of collaboration that is uh, ongoing. But I underline that the use of that in terms of amounts and timing is still an independent decision of the, of the Fed, of the central bank. So there are aspects in which the independence of the central bank in managing then uh, the total liquidity, the, uh, the interest rates it wants, uh, all of that is, are still independent decisions of the central bank. And that uh, uh, I don't anticipate is going to change quickly, although there will be a huge pressure uh, in some years time if inflation still emerges in at a significant a significant level because then if it happens then the central banks will have in their mandate uh, have in their mandate uh, the goal of uh, you know controlling inflation and for that they would have to uh, increase rates and all of that and with much higher uh, public debts and uh, private debts also at the same time governments will do a lot of pushback against central banks 
if they want to increase rates. My prediction there is that central banks will have to, on their own choice, will have to condone slightly higher inflation than the famous 2% that has been the rule for a few decades now. Uh, because uh, that the pressure would be overwhelming and in the end they could lose their legal independence. Can I say that the, the, the threat of inflation is remote? Really. Yes, I, I I, think I, that's my view too, uh, and, and the reason, I, I, I the was reason, just saying, if it comes, then that problem will... But it will only come if we expand economic activity. It won't come from the, the, the Fed, you know, printing more money. The, no, no, that, no. Is, that is a monetarist theory. No, the, no, no, there is no monetarism. And monetarism. because there is no... Monetarism is that, that, that monetarism like that is that. No, but, but because there is no strategy and because the economic model, so the economic model is this, that the, the central banks should be independent and that they should coordinate globally, but to protect the finance sector, not the real economy. So the real economy post-crisis was not protected. The people weren't protected, you know, jobs, all of that, investment, none of that was protected, but the finance sector was protected. So that's the, that's the problem with independent central banks. The ECB is a classic example of this. It exists to protect the private finance sector. And it's done that most successfully by, by international coordination. But there hasn't been global international coordination to save the economy or indeed now to save the ecosystem. So, you know, I think it's gone too far, Vito, this whole power of central bankers, these civil servants, these technocrats, who are not accountable, who are not elected, who never respond, who don't answer to us, now determining, you know, effectively uh, how the world economy operates. And I, I have to disagree with you. The question, you know, if you're in an emerging market, or, if, you know, if you live in Africa, if you're not one of the, the, the group, the privileged group that with access to the Fed swap lines, then to talk about sovereignty is a joke, right? You know, countries do not exist, no, uh, do not have sovereignty. They, 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 that's the whole point. The whole point is they cannot introduce capital controls. They okay. can't manage their exchange rates. The system is designed to prevent them from doing that. And let's, let, let's give Victor a quick chance to respond, but we're actually running over now. So Victor, if you just want to um, wrap it up with your concluding remarks and respond. Yes, well, I, I just on this uh, last uh, point, uh, Indeed, uh, developing countries could try and could have policies. Uh, it has costs, but uh, could have policies to really have, uh, an, instead of uh, external deficits, uh, external circles, and then they would obtain the, uh, the convertible currencies to, uh, that they, they need. Uh, okay, but that's then to say that, you know, it's not the Fed determining everything. Uh, uh, it also depends on some difficult, uh, but some uh, national choices uh, of, uh, of countries. Yeah. Regarding, regarding the central bank uh, role and, in the, uh, and, uh, and independence, well, it's a technocratic institution, but the legal mandate is defined yeah. by governments and parliaments. And for instance, uh, regarding the ECB, it's the treaty that has been voted in all national parliaments that okay. says that it is price stability as the overriding objective to everything. Mm -hmm. So it's not in the ends of uh, the uh, ECB or uh, central bank to change the mandate uh, because they have to respect the law, of course, uh, and that's uh, what happens. And of course, in, in the world, as it is organized, and it's not for the central banks also to change that, in the world as it is organized, monetary policy, what they do uh, according to the goals that the law defines, is transmitted via several financial variables. And that's why, of course, what they do, they cannot ignore what are the consequences for the financial markets, not for shareholders. It was nothing to do with the Fed that the shareholders in the US, in the uh, 2008 and uh, 2009 crisis were not touched. That has nothing to do with the fact that right. was government policy and so on and so on. So 
let's also not exaggerate the uh, encompassing powers of central banks that uh, are really not there. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much to Anne and Vitor. We're, um, we're only five minutes behind, which is great, all things considered. Um, so thank you for your contributions. And it's, thank you, thank you, Anne. Final comments on you know, central bank mandates and what they do are an important part of this discussion on MMT because we'd be getting rid of a lot of them. So. Oh yeah, yeah. that would have to be changed. Yeah, great. Um, let's move on to our third and final panel today, though of course there will be a longer Q&A at the very end of this. Um, and and we, I've been surprised by um, how accepting of MMT everyone has been actually in that a lot of people have um, suggested there's not a whole lot new in a lot of what an M MMT is doing. But I want to introduce our last three speakers. Um, we've got L. Randall Ray, Stephanie Kelton, and Larry Kotlikoff. So um, a great panel. Um, first of all, for L. Randall Ray, he's a professor of economics at Bard College. Um, he's one of kind of the, the founding fathers of MMT and is working to republish the work of the late financial economist Hyman Minsky. Um, then we've got Stephanie Kelton. Stephanie has been a leading spokesperson for MMT. She's a professor of economics and public policy at Stony Brook University. Um, she was a senior economics advisor to the 2016 and 2020 Biden, oh, sorry, Sanders campaigns, but now has been brought in to advise the Biden campaign as well. Um, so we're glad she could fit us in amidst those meetings. And um, to plug another book, her new book is actually, I don't think quite hot off the press, but is coming out. Um, in early June, the deficit myth, MMT and the birth of the people's economy. And I can say having read an advanced copy of it, it's really readable and does help explain what MMT is all about. And then finally, we've got Larry Kotlikoff. Um, Larry is a professor of economics in my hometown uh, in Boston at Boston University. Uh, he's a research associate at NBER and a fellow at the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. And he previously also uh, had experience with government um, serving on Ronald Reagan's uh, Council of Economic Advisor. And I think he's the only one here who was a writing candidate for president of the US in 2016. So um, we've got a great panel and I'm going to invite uh, uh, Randall Ray to step in and offer his comments first, followed by Stephanie and then Larry. Um, so Randall, if you want to take it away. All right. Um well, I'm sure everyone knows of um, Larry Kotlikoff's uh, views on uh, the debt and the deficit. And I think um, the latest projections that he has given is that um, we've got something like $200 uh, trillion dollars of um, debt that is going to burden our grandkids. And I think he's projected that the government's deficit is going to run at about 10% of GDP. Oh, Randall, if I could just ch jump in, if you could go full screen, it would be... Um, uh, oh, right. Yeah, on the slides, you mean? Yeah. Yeah. There we go. Um, yeah. uh, so anyway, that um, the deficits are going to run about 10% of GDP for, uh, forever. So. Uh, I know that there's already been discussion of some of the tenets of uh, MMT. You already had Warren and you're going to get Stephanie. Um, and I, Vitor also, I, I think, presented pretty accurately a lot of what we claim. Um, so I thought I would just go right in to the debt and the deficit <clears throat> and present some data. Um, this <clears throat> first slide takes a look at U.S. government spending. Um, per capita and as a percent of GDP, um, federal government, total government. And if you just look at the, the top orange line here, I think you can see my arrow. <clears throat> There's just no story there. Um, it's been pretty flat uh, since 1960. Um, so government spending uh, doesn't seem to have done anything unusual that would lead to uh, growing deficits and growing debt. If we look at the federal government's deficit, we do see a bit of a trend here. Um, so of course there's a big deficit in World War II, 25% of GDP. Uh, and then we see it bouncing around, virtually always in deficit, uh, but well below 5%. And then we see towards the end of this period that the fluctuation is quite a bit bigger and the average deficits are uh, big. 
So I wanted to try to look at that and explain uh, what has been going on. And there are going to be two aspects to the story. Um, the debt ratio also has been rising on trend for quite a while uh, since the years of Reagan. But you really see a uh, kink in the curve with the global financial crisis. And there's little doubt that we're going to see another huge uh, kink in the curve um, with the uh, coronavirus uh, pandemic. And um, it, it looks like uh, poor economic performance certainly seems to increase uh, the deficit and the debt. And um, good economic performance, uh, such as during the um, Clinton years, and then again in the uh, real estate bubble seems to uh, reduce the rate of growth of the debt. Um, but we could take an even longer uh, perspective, go back to essentially the founding of the nation. And we see that the debt ratio, so this is the debt ratio to GDP, has grown at 1.82%, let's call it 2% uh, over the whole period. The debt ratio has been growing on trend. Now, it grew a lot slower uh, before 1930, and this was because we had uh, more, we had a lot of positive years where the uh, debt ratio grew, but even more negative years where the debt ratio fell. That has really changed since uh, 1931, where the debt ratio has gone up 83 uh, times, and it has gone down over five times so that the growth of the uh, debt ratio has been running around 4%, over 4% since then. Okay, so uh, what's been going on? If you look at uh, government tax revenue transfer payments, we tend to think of these as being automatic stabilizers, and you do see that tax receipts uh, really plummet going through recessions, which are the shaded areas. So tax revenue literally falls off a cliff when you go into recession. And it'll be interesting to see the numbers for this year. Um, we used to have pretty strong counter cyclical transfer payments, but they have become much less counter cyclical than they used to be with probably some uh, reduction of the social safety net. If you look at uh, tax revenues and you divide those into the kind that are withheld, uh, so we could call that the, the tax on wages, um, and uh, the other kind that is not on wages, you see that there's a great fluctuation. The fluctuation has increased considerably in recent years, and especially for the non-withheld kind of tax revenue those fluctuate tremendously and uh, fall at uh, precipitous rates in downturns. If we look at government uh, consumption and investment, sort of like my first uh, uh, slide, there's not a huge story to tell here. Uh, if anything, the growth rate of both government consumption and investment has gone down, and they are not counter -cyclical. Um, they actually tend to go down in recessions and up in expansion, so the opposite of what you want. So what I'm saying is the thing that really moves in a way to produce budget deficits in bad times is tax revenue. It's not the government spending. Coronavirus could be different. We shall see. The second story I want to tell is the one that's related to the sectoral balances, and probably many people are now familiar uh, with this approach developed by Wynne Godley that MMT has adopted from the very beginning. We worked alongside Wynne Godley at the Levy Institute. And so we divide uh, the economy as a whole into three sectors. The um, blue is the private domestic sector, that's households and firms taken together. You can see a strong cyclical movement. The private sector uh, runs large surpluses in recessions, and deep recessions lead to surpluses of 10% or more of their uh, income. You can see it's uh, virtually always above the line, and this would be true if you went all the way back to 1929. The exceptions were 1929 and the Clinton expansions, 
uh, in which uh, the private sector ran big deficits equal to almost 5% of GDP. Um, and we did that for almost a decade, except during the Bush recession when uh, the household sector started to slip a bit. Um, the government sector in red, uh, virtually always in deficit, uh, highly uh, cyclical, as I uh, said before. And uh, if we had a closed economy, these two would exactly balance. That is to say that the government deficit would equal the private sector surplus. Uh, we take a Keynesian approach and we see the injections as being the cause of the leakages. The private sector's surplus is a leakage, and that is um, created and sustained by budget deficits. They allow the private sector to net save, and they allow the private sector to accumulate the uh, safest asset on the planet and maybe in the universe, which is U.S. government uh, federal debt. The, the third uh, balance is the foreign balance, and you can see uh, until Reagan, it really never mattered. We ran small current account surpluses. Since Reagan, we run current account deficits. Uh, since we're presenting this as the foreign balance, it's positive when we have a current account deficit. You can see that that has been very consistent. We always have current account deficits, and they have tended to grow over time. Um, and the, the point of showing this is that if somebody wants to tell me how we are going to balance the government's budget, they've got to tell me how we're going to deal with either private sector surpluses that are extremely financially fragile and always crash, 1929, uh, again, in 2007, they will crash or how we get the rest of the world to decide that they're going to run balanced uh, current accounts against us. It's out of our control. So I wanna hear their story of how they're gonna make that happen. Okay, um, I, I looked at uh, the relationship between economic growth uh, on the horizontal axis and the federal budget balance. If you were a neoclassical economist, you would think that budget uh, deficits crowd out investment, therefore should lead to lower spending. So you might expect a negative relation. If you are a 1960s Keynesian, you see deficits as stimulating the economy, leading to faster growth. And if you plot it, what you get is a, sc a scatter plot. There's no obvious correlation at all. Um, and the reason for that, you know, if you think about it for just a few seconds, there are two ways to get a big budget deficit. You can do it the ugly way, and that is you move from point A to point B. That is, your economic growth collapses, and that produces a budget deficit because the tax revenues disappear. Uh, the uh, high budget deficit will tend to encourage recovery you will move towards point C, and with recovery, the budget deficit will go down to point D. Uh, so the, um, you, you could also embark on, let's say, a public infrastructure spending plan, and that might move you from point A to point C. That would be the good way to get a budget deficit. Anyway, if you plot uh, the historical data, looking at the decade of the 90s, we began with the, the uh, uh, recession of Bush, and we have a high, for the, for the time, a high budget deficit, and that helped us to restore growth over the Clinton years, and we actually end up with a budget surplus. We end 2001 right there. Now let's see what happens from 2001. The uh, economic growth increases. And the budget deficit does drop, not by a lot, but it drops a bit. We go into the recession. We go up here to the depths of the recession with a budget deficit of 10%. That promotes recovery, and we go down. So we do these loop-de-loops -de -loops, uh, with budget deficits uh, going up mostly the bad way. Um, people worry that uh, budget deficits and growth of outstanding government debt will lead to 
rising interest rates, which increase debt service, and you get into an unsustainable debt trap because the debt service adds to the deficit, increases the debt ratio, and so on, 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 on. Okay, well, if you look at the data, it becomes pretty clear that the debt service ratio follows the Fed funds rate with a lag. So it, the Fed is the determinant of the debt service ratio. It's really not the debt ratio. The debt ratio has been going up and debt service has been going down. Last picture, I imagine I'm out of time. Um, <clears throat> everyone's worried about the US government debt ratio to US GDP. And there is some reason to believe that that's not the correct denominator. Uh, if we look at US federal government debt to world GDP, uh, back in the Bretton Woods period, we were at about 17%. Uh, most of that held in the US, okay? The, uh, this is to, uh, sorry, to global GDP, not US GDP. Um, and it was only about 1% held by foreigners relative to GDP. We are back at about the same point we were in 1960 with a U.S. federal government debt ratio to world GDP of approaching 18 percent. And what has happened since the breakdown of Bretton Woods is that federal government debt has become the safe asset the rest of the world wants to accumulate. And we're below 8 percent of GDP. My suspicion is that there is still a huge global demand for U.S. government bonds. We are very, a very long way from satiating the global demand for U.S. dollars and accumulating those dollars in the form of the safest asset on the planet. I'll stop. Thank you. Great for that. Or thank you for that presentation. Um, we're going to hear from Stephanie next. I think we've got Stephanie here somewhere. There we are. Yep. Oh, great. Okay. Um, well, thank you. I, uh, I coordinated with Randy before putting some slides together, but I didn't coordinate with Warren. And so there is some overlap here, but I think maybe that's okay if people are joining in at different times and uh, hearing different parts. So let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, I will do that right now. Great. Is it good? Yep. And is it full screen or nope? I guess I probably need to do that. Okay. So, well, anyway, thanks for mentioning the book. It comes out June 9th. Uh, a lot of this stuff is, is in there. Um, so here's some of the repetition with, uh, I think, a point that Warren emphasized again and again. Uh, and that is one of sequencing. So what we are in part trying to do in, with MMT is to help give people a better understanding of the monetary operations and the ways in which governments like the US, like the UK, like Australia, uh, currency issuing governments uh, actually spend. And so we're trying to fix what I've described in this slide as broken thinking. Okay, the, the broken thinking would have us believe that the federal government like a household, like private business, like a state or local government, has to go out and find the money in order to spend. And the primary ways in which the government is supposed to raise uh, funds, raise revenue, are either through taxing the current population or essentially taxing future populations, right? They can raise taxes or they can borrow. So this idea, and I've created a, a little mnemonic to help people sort of understand and remember this, is I'm calling it the TABS model, right? Taxing and borrowing come first. They are primary, they precede spending. So once the government goes out and collects up the dollars, either by taxing or borrowing to cover any shortfall, then and only then is it in a position to go out and spend. And that inevitably leads politicians and pundits and others to wrestle with this question whenever government proposes to build on an existing program or introduce a new government program, the question is always how are you gonna pay for it? In other words, who's gonna pick up the tab? 
where is the money going to come from? How much of this is going to be, uh, you know, paid for by today's taxpayers? And how much of this are we going to put on the tab of future taxpayers in the form of uh, borrowing and, and adding to the debt, so forth? So, you know, this is, this goes back decades and decades. And you hear this kind of thing, uh, you know, hear from Margaret Thatcher, who said, look, the government has no money of its own. It is your tax which pays for spending. There is only taxpayer money. Okay, so this was her way of saying, if you are going to come to me with a request to expand existing programs, you're going to have to pay for it, right? There is only taxpayer money. And so fast forward uh, 35 years or whatever it is, and here we are, right? Bogged down politically in the same kind of rhetoric. So in Washington speak, and I think you mentioned that I did spend some time uh, working in the Senate for the Budget Committee. And so I think it's important, a lot of people don't seem to understand what it means to ask this question, how will you pay for it? In, in the Beltway world, in politics, in Washington, this question has a very specific meaning. And it means that we are asking lawmakers if they have a plan, a credible plan, to um, subtract a dollar out of the economy for every dollar that they are proposing to spend into the economy. In other words, we, we say, well, what's your pay for? You wanna do a trillion dollars of infrastructure investment? Okay, show me where a trillion dollars is gonna come from. The idea is we expect lawmakers, now I realize we're in a coronavirus world and we're deficit spending, but set that aside for a moment. The, the conventional thinking is that we want our politicians, we want lawmakers adhering to what in the US is known as PAYGO, right? That um, PAYGO means, you know, show me the money. Where is the money gonna come from to pay for all of this spending? PAYGO is a self-imposed budgetary constraint. It is Congress saying to itself, we won't authorize new expenditures unless they can be fully offset. In other words, that they won't add to the deficit. We will find the money in one of two places. We will either raise new revenue to cover the cost of the expenditure, proposed spending, or we'll carve money out of some other area of the budget. So if we put a trillion into um, infrastructure over a period of years, we can uh, carve money out of defense or some other line item of the budget so that we don't add to the deficit. And what this does is lock us into what I'm calling here an epic struggle, right? Because you have to win two fights. You don't just have to persuade your colleagues uh, in the House and in the Senate to vote for the spending that you're proposing. You also have to get them to vote for the tax increase, usually, because typically, you know, people don't say, oh, well, we'll just deficit spend and that's how we'll do it. So the impulse is to pay for everything with new revenue. And that means you have to win two fights. You have to get people to vote for the spending and the tax increase that goes along with it. So we lock these things together. And one of the things that MMT does is to try to demonstrate that we're thinking about taxes the wrong way. We're thinking about taxes as a source of financing for the federal government. We think of taxes as revenue, right? And MMT says this, is, this has been the wrong way to think of taxes for, well, I can do the math real quick, 75, 80 years, right? At least going back as far as in this piece that I have up, uh, Beardsley Rummel. Rummel was, before they used the term president, he was chairman of the New York Fed. And in 1946, Beardsley Rummel gave a speech and uh, this was published. And the title of the thing is, Taxes for Revenue are Obsolete. And in MMT, we refer back to this, not because it was the first or, you know, in some sense original, Lerner made the same arguments, Ab Lerner, uh, even before Rummel. But the point is, it's laid out nicely in this piece. And uh, Rummel says this is the wrong way to think about a currency issuing government with a floating exchange rate, which was Warren's point. And he said, uh, taxes aren't about, aren't about raising revenue for the currency issuing government, but we should think of taxes as important for other purposes. And one of the most important is um, mitigating inflation risk. 
mitigating inflationary pressures. Taxes are important because they can be used to create incentives and disincentives to impact you know, consumer behavior, production, and so forth, and for altering the distribution of wealth and income. So, and, and as Warren pointed out earlier, to drive the currency itself, right? To give value to the currency and make it possible for the government to provision itself by issuing its otherwise intrinsically worthless token, okay? So on taxes for subtraction, MMT says the, we should think about taxes and the effects of taxation being that they reduce the purchasing power of someone somewhere in the economy. But what they don't do is increase the purchasing power of the federal government, of the issuer. So you don't increase the fiscal capacity of the federal government because the federal government collects a lot of taxes and books it on its balance sheet at the Fed and the Treasury's general account has a huge you know, balance and you say, oh, now the government is uh, very much better off, right? Better capable of financing large uh, spending projects or something. It's, it has no more and no less fiscal capacity than it has if its balance is zero. Okay, so that's one important thing uh, MMT says. We ask that we think of taxes not as revenue, but as inflation offsets. So we want to resequence things. We think that the PAYGO model is broken, that the proper sequencing is to recognize that the spending comes first. As Warren explained, the government has to spend or lend, or its fiscal agents do, the currency before anyone can have it to either pay taxes or buy bonds. So if we reorder this, we see the spending comes first, and taxes and buying bonds are secondary operations. So in this sense, you could say, and I put it here, in a sense, all government spending is already quote unquote money financed. Why? Because when the government spends, the spending is carried out as the government's fiscal agent, the Fed, changes the numbers in the appropriate bank accounts. And that changing of numbers, that marking up the size of the bank account, results in the creation of new financial balances. If we want to call it money, we can say new money, right? Bank reserves, and depending on what's being purchased and the deposits, commercial bank deposits, right? Banks, uh, deposits in commercial banks. So if the government is not revenue constrained, and in a sense, its spending is self-financing, then how do governments in the modern era actually spend? And this is the answer. This is a series of tweets that was put out by the staff director on the US Senate Budget Committee. And he was worked up uh, over the increases in the size of the military budget. And so he goes out and he tweets, look, Congress keeps appropriating money so that you know, there are more warplanes and weapons systems. We spend and we spend on the military. How can we keep giving more money to the Pentagon? And the answer is, step one is how we can keep giving money to the Pentagon or to anybody else. Congress appropriates the spending. That's where, that's where the financing comes from, okay? Congress decides, <clears throat> excuse me. So in a sense, you, you could say the votes fund the spending. Once Congress commits to spending, the spending will happen. Now, there's a lot that happens on the back end, right? Coordination between Treasury and Fed. We can talk about all of that, and I've written about all of that. But the simplest way to say this is to say that Congress can commit to spending money it does not have, right? And it can do that because of the established institutional network the monetary system that's in place that assures that congressional che that treasury checks don't bounce, right? That the Fed will always carry out every payment that has been authorized by Congress. And Warren brought this up earlier, but for people who are dropping in, uh, don't take my word for it. We tend to think that it's all taxpayer money, as Thatcher said. Is that uh, tax money that the Fed is spending? It's not tax money. We simply use the computer to mark up the uh, size of the account. Okay, so now you ha you've heard uh, Powell say it the other night, now you've heard Bernanke say it. I mean, this is the way that it works, okay? So MMT is trying to help us break this mental link that we have between 
the government's taxing on the one hand and spending on the other hand. And to separate these, right? And to think of them separately and distinctly. What is the purpose of taxing? Why would you change a certain tax rate? Why would you institute a new tax? What is the, um, the, the effect of making that change rather than thinking of it in terms of financing government spending? So um, moving to quickly the deficit, Randy covered this kind of stuff, but I think there's just a lot of uh, unfortunate language. You know, we use this word deficit. It scares people. It gets people anxious. It carries with it a connotation that governments are doing something that's inherently irresponsible by running a budget deficit or a fiscal deficit. Uh, why do we use that word? Why do we call it a deficit? It is every bit as much a surplus as it is a deficit. Every bit as much. Okay, so when the government engages in deficit spending, Let's say the government spent these 10 bundles into the economy, and now it comes along and it, it taxes four of those bundles away. Okay, we label that a deficit, and somewhere on some ledger, someone is gonna make a notation that reflects the government has engaged in deficit spending. It's gonna write a minus six down on the government ledger. But what we fail to do is to remind people that there's a plus six on the other side, right? The counterpart to the government deficit is the non-government surplus. And that's what Randy was uh, showing in that sector balance uh, graph that when Godly uh, sort of popularized. So, you know, before the whole coronavirus um, pandemic, uh, we were looking at staring down a future where there was a lot of anxiety about the fact that the government was on track to run trillion dollar deficits this year, next year, the following year, and so forth. You know, trillion dollar deficits. And you see these headlines, and I look at this and I read it differently. I read this. When I see that headline, I read trillion dollar surpluses could be the new normal. Now, isn't that more comforting, right? Doesn't that just kind of lower the level of anxiety. It's just using, it's choosing to use a different adjective to describe what's happening on balance sheets. So it's a matter of perspective, right? You say, I see a six, I say, I see a nine. Well, depending on which side of the ledger you want to view things from, you're going to see, uh, you're going to see things differently. So very quickly, here's again, um, very, very, very quickly. Randy's uh, chart that he had up just a few moments ago. In, if we really think about the deficit in the proper context, which is how Win Godly wanted us to think about it, we can easily see that the government's budget is always in balance. All you have to do is balance it against the rest of the sectors in the economy, and it is always in balance. In other words, it will always net out to zero. And as Randy said, uh, and, and here, you know, R Randy talked about the fact that the government's budget will move, or the government's uh, budget outcome will move endogenously. That in a weak economy, deficits expand on their own. And in a growing economy, in a recovery, deficits tend to shrink on their own because of the automatic stabilizers. I thought I heard Anne earlier uh, make the claim that somehow MMT doesn't understand this. That's uh, if, if I misunderstood, then my apologies, but um, that's what I understood her to be saying. Of course, we emphasize this all, all of the time. Uh, and as Randy said, we can increase deficits the ugly way, which is to allow a collapsing economy to push deficits way up, or we can assist the economy when, I think he talked about demand leakages, when the private sector wants to spend less and save more, for example, the deficit will increase on its own, okay? It, that will happen. There will be an, an endogenous shift toward bigger deficits to accommodate the non-government, or in this case, the private sector's desire to increase its net financial assets. Or the government could proactively um, assist the private sector in increasing its uh, net financial assets. In other words, you could say at some point in time, I see that the deficit has gotten too small, like during the Clinton surpluses. When Godley and Randy wrote about this, they warned about the dangers of allowing the deficit to get too small. 
the private sector's balance sheet position reversed from surplus into deficit. And by the time the economy went into recession in 2001, it was too late to accommodate in real time the private sector's uh, preferred position. But you got the Bush tax cuts and uh, the government tried to respond proactively late with expansionary fiscal policy. So deficits add to net financial assets to the rest of the economy. They can be too big, but they can also be too small. But I don't think we should ignore uh, or try to figure out how to eliminate budget deficits. To target the budget deficit would be uh, the wrong thing to do. It's not a proper role for policy to try policymakers to try to shrink or reduce budget deficits. <clears throat> that should never be the target of policy. So I'm wrapping up. Um, on to the question of the debt. The fact that government deficits currently involve matching deficit spending with bond sales is I think what creates the anxiety. It's not the deficits per se that make lawmakers and others anxious. It's the resulting increase in the public debt, right? It's the fact that the government borrows and that this thing that we label the national debt has increased. And Warren's point was that the national debt is nothing more than a historical record of all of the dollars the government has spent into the economy, not taxed back, that are currently being held, saved, in the form of US Treasuries, right? That's all it is. And so when we talk about the ability or the sustainability, uh, affordability, well, I think two things were missing. One is the bond sales themselves are optional, right? The bonds aren't financing the deficit because the bonds come after the government has already engaged in the deficit spending. The money to buy the bonds comes from the prior act of deficit spending, right? So when we saw on that previous slide, the government dropping 10 bundles in, swiping four bundles away by taxing, leaving six bundles behind, those six bundles are there as a result of the government's deficit spending. Those six bundles are available now to buy six bundles of US treasuries. The money to buy bonds comes from the deficit spending. The coordination happens in the background. Uh, I think you're gonna be able to hear this, but this is obviously a very old video of Alan Greenspan uh, speaking to the question of limits on government deficits. And I wanna play this. The consolidated federal budget because of the fact that they can essentially finance any amount of deficit that they want merely by printing bonds and making certain they sell in the market because we are involved in that financing of the federal budget. All right, so what he says, you, you all I hope heard, the federal government can uh, finance any deficit it chooses simply by, he said, printing bonds and making sure that they sell in the marketplace. And then he goes on to say, and we're involved in that process. And that, I think, ought to allay a lot of concerns about bond vigilantes and China and you know the possibility of a sudden stop or whatever the case may be. What's happening behind the scenes with the primary dealers in coordination on a daily basis between officials at Treasury and the Fed is that the government's deficit spending is being matched with bond sales. Those are being run through the primary dealer market. We could talk about why. And as Warren said, the Fed is there, stands ready, if necessary, to do a reserve ad so that Treasury can do a reserve drain. In other words, this is all coordinated quite beautifully between Treasury and Fed and the primary dealers so that in fact, the government can always spend money it does not have, that it can always commit to spending whatever number Congress decides to write down, if it's this three trillion house bill, the 2.2 trillion before that, or whatever else, there is nobody out there prearranging the financing, collecting the money, which allows Congress to then spend, Congress spends new money into existence. So very uh, end here. 
this question about what can we afford and MMT and the limits. MMT, you know, my book is coming out. I know Randy has talked about this. I know Bill has talked about this. Um, yes, of course, there are limits and there are limits not just in terms of raw materials and hard resource constraints, but biophys there are limits in terms of the environment. There are environmental limits and we are extremely sensitive to that. Uh, as well, and I think that that's clear in the in the literature. So when we think about questions of limits and what governments that are currency issuing governments uh, can afford, it is true that if you are looking at an economy that has enormous unused resource capacity, whether it's in uh, capacity utilization rates of factories, You've got idle resources, machines, capital, workers. Those things can be hired by government, mobilize those resources, put them to use, and put them to use serving the public good, right? In, in the interest of the public purpose. That's what MMT has been about. So uh, you don't really need to see this, except to say that here we are, you know, clearly in a situation today where we are in a depressed economy which affords the government the fiscal space in terms of the real resource capacity to at some point when we are ready for the recovery phase uh, of this pan getting through the pandemic there are going to be an awful lot of idle resources uh, available to be hired and put to use and that's where i think um, this discussion that ann wants to have about how to best employ these resources and to think about climate and to prioritize other, um, uh, other spending objectives is important. Last point is, am I over or do I have time for one more point? Uh, if you just make it quick. The last point is this. I think that only MMT uh, really thinks like this. When it comes to the federal budgeting process, what MMT is about is replacing an artificial revenue constraint with a real resource constraint, with an inflation constraint. And I can tell you, having served in the Senate on the Budget Committee, there is no one who thinks about inflation risk when it comes to writing legislation and proposing ambitious big new spending. So it would be very common if we were in you know, a pre-coronavirus world where the official unemployment rate was three and a half percent or so, and maybe we had an economy that some people would say was fairly close to full employment, it would be very common to have lawmakers write a bill, say we wanna do $2 trillion of infrastructure because Trump wants to and Pelosi and Schumer said they want to, let's do $2 trillion of infrastructure and let's pay for it with a wealth tax right? Some tax on the very, very richest people. You send that bill to CBO. CBO scores the bill. They say, it's a great bill. It doesn't add to the deficit. They send it back. Now, Congress votes on the bill. Okay, imagine that you have just authorized a couple of trillion dollars of new spending into an economy, suppose, at full employment without resource slack. And you feel good about it because it doesn't add to the deficit. But what you've done is you've created an offset, right? Your pay for um, is gonna take $2 trillion away from people who weren't gonna spend much, if any, of that money in the first place. So what I'm saying is MMT thinks not just about when and whether offsets are needed, but also make sure that the offsets do what they are supposed to do, which is mitigate inflation risk. So with that, I yield the screen. <laughs> Great, thank you. Um, let's hear from Larry Koblikoff um, once your presentation is off. Grace, Larry, we're looking forward to your comments. Okay, it's a great pleasure to be here. I've, I've learned a lot um, about MMT that I didn't, uh, I think I had some idea, but I'm, I've got a better idea. Um, I'm not a believer, believer but um, there are certainly some areas of common ground, uh, I think, uh, among you know between me and and supporters of mmt on certain issues uh let me uh kind of get to the uh, nitty-gritty right right away um so one idea here is that uh debt doesn't matter uh, i've heard this said um in different ways by different people 
over over the um, last uh, couple hours. Uh, so uh, we've even heard Stephanie say that deficits are surpluses. So let me give you my perspective from uh, working for a long time on uh, this general issue, uh, not of debt per se, but of um, uh, intergenerational redistribution. Because I say that because uh, fundamentally what economics has to say about, or it's really what economics is really concerned about when it comes to debt or pay as you go social security programs or pay as you go Medicare, pay as you go defense spending, any of these programs, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's one of the major concerns is what generation is going to pay for the bill. Uh, so it's really the intergenerational uh, policy that, that comes down uh, to the core issue. And the other key thing here is that, and this is really uh, relevant to all the things that um, uh, Randy presented uh, and others presented in terms of uh, charts and uh, data. The, the deficit, um, unfortunately, is not a well-defined number. Uh, so, and the time series of deficits historically is not well defined, and the um, and the time series of taxes and the time series of spending are also not well defined. I'm going to explain that very simply. Uh, there's a paper on my website that I wrote with Jerry Green, a professor at Harvard. It's called on the uh, general relativity of fiscal language. That you can take a look at under articles at kotlikoff.net on the on the general relativity of fiscal language. So, what is the problem with the with the, the deficit not being well defined? Well, it kind of goes back to uh, a problem, you know, that Einstein uh, put his finger on uh, with respect to measuring time and distance. Uh, where you're going through uh, space at what speed, what direction, what speed is going to determine how you're measuring time and distance right right here at a, a point at a given place. And uh, there's all kinds of different measures of time and distance, uh, depending on each person's uh, kind of physical voc uh, vocabulary, their phys physical uh, vocabulary, their, their reference, uh, frame of reference. In economics, it's really the same thing. We have the same kind of problem uh, that things are not well defined. And uh, these concepts, deficits, taxes, uh, spend, uh, transfer payments, they're not well defined. So let me make this concrete. Uh, suppose I take, I'm Uncle Sam, I'm the government. I come to Roger this year and I take uh, $50,000 from him. And I say to Roger, uh, Roger, I'm gonna give that back to you uh, with interest in 10 years. Now, did I tax Roger 50,000 right now this year? And am I promising to make a transfer payment to him of 50,000 plus interest in let's say 10 years? Or did I borrow 10,000 from him this year and promise to pay him back what I'll call principal plus interest in 10 years? Well, economics doesn't pin this down. It doesn't tell us what words to connect to the uh, transactions, uh, to the inflows and outflows of money from the government back to the public, to the government and back to the public it doesn't tell us how to label things. So the labeling is completely up for grabs, and that's what this paper with Jerry Green shows, that it's not well-defined. It's not well-defined in any neoclassical model with rational agents. So by rational, I mean people are just agents that are not confused by labels. You can have all kinds of problems in the economy, but um, you're still not gonna have uh, the, uh, these things well-defined. So what is well-defined? Well, well-defined well is uh, the government's intertemporal budget constraint. And uh, Stephanie and others were reminding us that that constraint basically says that under any labeling convention uh, that's internally consistent, the present value of the outlays has got to be equal to the present value of the receipts. And the receipts uh, can be labeled you know, taxes plus the increase in, in the time path of uh, money. So that's the sense in which uh, taxes and, and reprinting of money uh, can be used to pay for spending. And I think that's really the point Stephanie was making uh, in different ways uh, in her presentation. But um, the, the, the exact amount of uh, debt, uh, the deficit this year, uh, 
is really a function of how we've uh, labeled things uh, like this year, but also historically. So the entire time path of deficits and taxes and transfers would be very different if we went back historically and used different words to describe in a, in a manner that's perfectly internally consistent uh, uh, what we were doing in the past. So, so that brings us to the point of what we should measure. And the, what we should be measuring, again, is this intertemporal budget constraint of the government and ask um, if we don't get current generations to pay more for the outlays, how much uh, will their lifetime remaining fiscal burden have to go up to cover the shortfall? That's the generational equity issue here. And historically, the US has been uh, starting, you know, in the post-war period, has been engaged in enormous redistribution across generations, but it's mostly used language, labels, to keep it off the books. So if you think about the unfunded liability to Social Security, cheers, Megan, the, um, uh, the uh, Social Security trustees in April put out a report. If you go, go to table 6F1, very deep in the appendix, you'll find that the uh, uh, unfunded liability for Social Security is $53 trillion. That's like two and a half times uh, official debt right now. Uh, that's debt that's off the books. They use the words taxes. They went to Roger and they said, give us money and we're gonna give it back to you in the future. Uh, or we're gonna give you, or went to young people, took, took money and said, we're gonna pay you back uh, benefits in the future. And we're gonna not call that borrowing and taxes. We're gonna call it bar uh, tax, we're gonna, sorry, we're not gonna call it borrowing and repayment of principal plus interest. We're gonna call it uh, taxes and transfers. So they kept off the obligation of paying uh, future benefit beneficiaries, social security beneficiaries, they kept it off the books just by the choice of those words. So if you look at that unfunded liability, it's 53 trillion. If you do this for the entire fiscal system, put everything on the books, you find that the fiscal gap for the country uh, is around 165 trillion. This is my best current number, so it's lower than uh, what Randy referenced, uh, not the 200 trillion, but more like 165 trillion. That's before the whole coronavirus problem. And uh, what we need is about a 53% increase. To understand how big that problem is, we need a 53% immediate and permanent increase in the path of taxes, uh, or we could also just print a whole lot more money, about 6% of GDP every year, uh, to, uh, uh, to cover those outlays that are not going to be covered by this intertemporal budget because the present value of the outlays is far bigger, uh, 165 trillion bigger than the present value of the projected receipts, including the printing of money under current pol inflation policy. So we have a big problem and it shows up in uh, real terms when you look at the national saving rate, which has gone from the life cycle model predicts that if you take from young savers and give to old spenders, they will spend it and the national saving rate will go down. And that's what we've seen happen. The national saving rate's gone from uh, 15 per, 4, 13% in the 50s and 60s to uh, 3% in the last two decades. And we've also had a decline in national investment. Uh, so the foreigners have not uh, brought in enough investment into the country to make up for the decline in US saving. And we also have this, um, major inequity with respect to our kids. It's not just that we're leaving them a terrible climate, uh, but we're also leaving them a horrible fiscal problem because we can't pay for what we've been spending up till now, let alone what we're now spending through this crisis. So that's what we should be focused on uh, when it comes to uh, deficits. Yes, you can, right now, it looks like you could print a lot more money and still get, um, uh, and not borrow and just print the money or, or borrow and then monetize the, the borrowing, uh, transactionally speaking, and not get a lot of inflation, but eventually it may kick in. You know, if you get the money multiplier to go back where it was in 2007, and the velocity to go back to where it was in 2007, given how much uh, base money we have now, uh, and it's increased by 50% over the last year, a large part over the last couple of months, uh, we're going to get a price level that's five times higher than it is today. So we have the basis for hyperinflation already in place. So we have to be very careful that we're not playing with fire, that we don't end up with stagflation. Uh, now, the uh, and also, the, the printing of money is not, uh, that we've been doing, is not 
free, there is seniorage. You don't see it in the form of inflation, but what you really have to understand is the seniorage is occurring in the form of no de deflation. If we had deflation, people that have uh, nominal money balances were getting, be getting a real capital gain on those, real purchasing power would be going up. The fact that we don't have deflation because we're printing so much money in, this, in the current crisis in, in the last years or so, uh, is really reducing the deflation and therefore generating real seniorage if you look at it carefully. So we have to understand that monetary finance is not free. It may seem free because we're not getting inflation, but we, we actually, it is, uh, we're getting non-deflation, which is uh, in effect the same thing. Uh, so uh, let me just say a few words um, about uh, the Green New Deal in closing here. So I, I want to, I, I unfortunately can't stay beyond the quarter to the hour so I'm going to uh, uh, hopefully get any questions you folks have out there for me early, and then I'm going to have to unfortunately head off to another meeting. But the uh, the new real the the Green New Deal, uh, the whole issue of how to deal with carbon taxation has been posed as a um, us them uh, kind of uh, situation where uh, we have to do we current generations have to do something to sacrifice to help future generations. Bill Nordhaus, who got the Nobel Prize for his work on uh, climate change, set the problem up that way as a problem of a social planner. But a public finance economist like myself would say, hey, this is the wrong formulation. What we have here is an externality, a negative externality. Current generations are not taking into account the damage of future generations when they burn fossil fuels. So what we need to do is, an, uh, is price the carbon correctly, but then we're gonna have an efficiency gain from fixing a bad externality. And guess what? We can share that efficiency gain across all generations. So there's a paper also at kotlikoff.net with co-authors called Making Carbon Ta Taxation a Generational Win-Win. Making Carbon Taxation a Generational Win-Win. And it shows how you can put on a carbon tax today and you could uh, cut other taxes, not to keep it revenue neutral, but by more to make current generations better off so that their improvement in welfare is the same as the improvement in, in welfare of everybody in the future. You can get a uniform across all generations welfare gain by fixing this carbon externality and make this a generational win-win. In other words, it had um, Greta Thornburg uh, come to the UN and rather than accuse uh, the delegates there of not caring about the next generations, which is true, and said, look, she should have said, look, you guys don't get, care about us and my, my generation or kids beyond, but let's make a deal. Let's cut a deal. Put on a carbon tax, cut your other taxes, cut them enough to get the, uh, a welfare increase that's as big as you're going to give us. We'll all be better off. And uh, that's going to, you know, according to this paper, about 5% of GDP, 5% uh, of uh, consumption of every generation improvement. And we certainly would uh, have a whole lot different, uh, uh, you know, very high carbon tax in the short run and would eliminate uh, use of coal immediately. So the Green New Deal needs to be uh, founded or grounded in economics, in public finance economics, not environmental economics, because that's where you can get everybody on board. Let me stop there. Great, thank you. Um, let me really quickly ask Stephanie and Randy to respond to you, Larry, particularly with respect to what you were saying about intergenerational uh, transfers, um, because you seem to think that they're inherent in this. I suspect there will be disagreement on that. So Larry or Stephanie, do you want to respond to that? Um, uh, sure. If, uh, first, er everything is paid for. Stephanie already explained that. Uh, future generations are not going to pay for our response to uh, coronavirus. They're not going to pay for the Green New Deal if we implement that. It's paid for uh, by Congress when they authorize the spending. So it's already been paid for. Uh, what we will be leaving to future generations uh, is uh, the debt stock, whatever it happens to be. It's a net financial asset, as Stephanie's pointing out. We agree with you that terminology matters a lot. We really shouldn't ever call this government debt. Uh, the framing would be that, hey, we're leaving our grandkids with a, a great financial asset, the safest one on planet Earth. Um, 
but we want to leave them more than that. We want to leave them with um, a sustainable economy. And I mean sustainable in, in many different senses of the term, but including environmentally sustainable. Uh, we want to leave them with a healthcare system that works, uh, not with the one we've got now. We want to leave them with the, the public infrastructure that they're gonna need. We want to leave them with a good retirement system, okay? And I don't, I don't mean one that uh, is balanced in your sense of the term. We want to leave them with the, the promise that they're going to have a good standard of living once they retire, better than what we, we are promised now. So I think that this is just extremely wrongheaded to, in the first place, just the, the notion of projecting to infinity government spending and government tax revenues and then discounting that back to the present, and then calling that a, a, a current debt just makes no sense. Uh, Stephanie might want to say something as well, so. No, the, the only thing that I would add is, again, if, if we accept, if we could agree to accept the STAB model, then we would recognize that the bond sales happen after the spending has been financed. And then we could further say, why bother issuing the bonds at all? Okay, if, if, if there's a problem with what Randy is calling this stock of assets, which is what they are, right? Uh, they're financial assets. If we have an issue with these financial assets, we could decide that from now on, no more selling treasuries. When the government, when Congress authorizes the three trillion in the next package, right, the House bill, we're gonna spend three trillion. Some number of dollars will be subtracted away in the form of taxes over the course of the fiscal year. At the end of the year, we will know how big the fiscal deficit has been. And all of those dollars will just sit in the banking system where the Fed will pay whatever the Fed chooses to pay on reserve balances. Okay? They could pay zero or they could pay something slightly above zero. But the, the bonds simply remove reserve balances and replace them with US treasuries. And this is what Warren was talking about, right? You debit the reserve account and credit the securities account. That's all that's happening when we talk about borrowing. And so the resulting government securities that we unfortunately call the national debt are what gets people very anxious. And so what all I'm saying is, so recognize that the sale of bonds is happening after the spending has taken place and further that it's optional. We don't have to offer people- Let me, let me, res let me respond. The, Go ahead. Um, so, uh, if you look at the congressional budget, we have to measure things in economics that are very difficult to measure. Uh, and the intertemporal budget of the economy and of the, the government are two things that are very difficult to, uh, to, uh, to, to measure, just like in physics, they're very difficult things to measure. But this is what our theory says. Any neoclassical uh, model of economic growth is gonna have an intertemporal budget constraint. Uh, and uh, the, uh, and it has to be satisfied. And yeah, there are some limit, some to, you know, some potentiality for efficiency gains for expanding that budget. If you're in a Keynesian situation, uh, you can certainly uh, have some, uh, you know, uh, additional leeway. Uh, there's even possibility for, uh, in some case, you know, you can, if you're a open economy like we are, we can beggar thy neighbor by uh, issuing treasuries and crowd out the global capital stock, not just our you know, own piece of it, and, and not have to face all the consequences of what we're uh, doing to the world's uh, saving and, and capital accumulation. But ultimately, we have to live within our economic theory and our models, and they, they say there are constraints. And, uh, and then, uh, you know, Stephanie, to your point about um, uh, the mechanics here, I think, you know, if you get down to it, you could say, you know, what you're saying is, what if we don't have any borrowing and we just um, print money? Uh, or let's go a little bit step, step even further. What if we just cut all taxes and have no borrowing and just print money for paying for everything the government uh, wants to do, all the expenditures, all the government consumption, lunch for the president? Well, uh, yeah, some people will put that money uh, in their bank account, it'll be put into the Fed, 
in reserve if the Fed tries to pay interest, uh, you know, and borrow those, uh, that money out of the economy and may not cause inflation, but there's also a very good chance that people will turn that money into a hot potato, that they'll see what's going on and they'll think of this as Weimar Republic 1921 and that we will get velocity to turn around from where, all it has to do is go back to where it was in 2007. That's the reality of where it was, you know? And uh, just take the quantity equation. I don't know if you believe in that, but, uh, or <laughs> maybe you don't, okay. The money multiplier, all it has to go back to, you know, I just, I think mechanically you'll see that we would have a dramatically higher price level if we got back to those relationships and there's nothing keeping the economy from getting there. Uh, so and going back there. So I think we do differ, uh, you know, respectfully, but uh, we do differ and uh, we do agree on certain things, but we're going to have to just differ on those. Okay, can I just say, we not only don't have to live within a neoclassical model, we don't live within a neoclassical model. The model is just plain wrong. Uh, well, okay. <laughs> okay. The, the money multiplier, nobody accepts that anymore. Talk to any central bankers around the world. No one accepts that anymore. Loanable funds model, nobody accepts that anymore. Okay, These are old uh, relics now. Nobody follows the neoclassical model anymore. Larry, did you want to respond to that quickly, or? Uh, well, most people that I, that I interact with in academ academia, uh, I think, do uh, basically deal with with models that have constraints, and uh, where where printing money is not a freebie, where it uh, either generates inflation or reduces deflation, and uh, where there's uh, there's, no, there's no magic to uh, you know, we, we have to actually pay for what we spend and it has to come out of our, our hides or our kids' hides. And that's the fundamental question we have to get to. Yeah, I wanted to ask a question to Stephanie and uh, Randy off the back of that, just relative to inflation. Um, because what is anchoring inflation expectations if you don't have a nominal anchor? Um, and Stephanie, your sink uh, picture at the end, uh, explain it all except for you know what is the theory of natural inflation for MMTers and how exactly um, how developed is your theory in terms of hiking taxes actually really being a constraint on inflation Go ahead. look I, I think that you know I'm not going to be able to give a full lecture on the MMT uh, inflation stuff this is chapter two of my book but um, people who are tuned in can look for uh, a piece that I think was um, very good that Scott Fulweiler co-authored with um, two or three others, Rowan Gray, Nathan Tankus, in the Financial Times on the MMT way of thinking about inflation. Okay, and I think that um, it is incorrect to, uh, to suggest or to believe that the solution to fighting inflation in MMT is always and everywhere a fiscal adjustment, a tax increase or a spending cut. That's not the way we think about it. Um, I would add though that Mariner Eccles, who was mentioned earlier, Eccles considered adjustments in fiscal policy um, to be, th these are his exact words, the most effective anti-inflationary means of reducing purchasing power. So Eccles really did as Fed chair uh, think that fiscal policy was probably the most potent anti-inflation uh, lever to pull, policy lever to pull. Look, there are a range of sources of inflation that aren't caused by the general state of aggregate demand. Uh, obviously, you can have inflationary pressures pick up well before the economy reaches, you referred to the bathtub or the sink picture, well before the economy reaches its um, resource capacity, right? Their inflation can happen for a lot of other reasons and we need to have uh, other tools at our disposal, not just the interest rate to deal with emerging inflationary pressures. We gotta figure out what's causing them. Look under the hood. Where is the inflationary pressure coming from? Is it basically you know, um, prescription drug prices? Is it imputed rental costs? Is it education? You know, what's driving the inflation before you figure out how best to address inflationary pressures? Um, taxes are 
I would say part of a whole suite, that's the way they put it in the FT piece, part of a whole suite of um, potential demand offsets that could be used to mitigate inflationary pressure. Uh, and then the last thing I'll add, because I know that if Warren is still here and listening, he probably would make this point, which he made earlier, which is the way we fight inflation today um, very well could be a source of additional inflationary pressure. In other words, raising interest rates to try to fight inflation when, as Warren was explaining, the increase in the interest rate works like expansionary fiscal policy in the sense that it produces additional interest income. And if you believe that bondholders spend at least a portion, uh, have a marginal propensity to consume out of interest income that's at least greater than zero, then raising interest rates um, could produce a fiscal impulse that's positive, that leads to higher spending. And, um, and so I'll just, that's a lot, but it's some of the way that, that we've talked about inflation in MMT. I just add on, on the taxes. Uh, what we want is automatic stabilizers. The maps I showed you show that taxes already are effective, maybe too effective. Maybe they take too much demand out of the economy um, when uh, we start to grow fast. Ta the federal revenues start uh, increasing at a pace of about 20% per year when we achieve good growth rates. So I think it's already there. We don't need to change that at all. Uh, I think we could make government spending uh, more of an automatic stabilizer, increasing in bad times, reducing spending in good times. And we have a proposal for that, and that is the job guarantee. The government stands ready to hire the unemployed in bad times, stands ready to let the private sector hire them away in good times. That's an automatic stabilizer that makes government spending uh, move in the right direction. We do not rely on Congress deciding, oh, now is the time we need to cut spending or uh, to raise taxes because we see inflation. Uh, we want automatic stabilizers. Okay, thanks. And the FT article that Stephanie referenced, Carla has helpfully put in the chat section. So if you want the link, go there. Um, Roger, you've got a question. Yeah, one uh, question before we lose Larry uh, and before we move on to the general uh, discussion. So I agree completely with Randy that um, that neoclassical economics is broken. The question is how it's broken. Um, and Stephanie's already, I think, partially responded to the question that I was gonna ask, but I'd like comments from all three of you. One of the things Larry pointed to was stagflation. Uh, and um, I wonder uh, if you think, any of you think that inflation can uh, reappear when we're well below full capacity uh, and if so, uh, why, how, and um, w what do you think would cause that? Maybe well, I don't mind who starts. That on. Yeah, let me take that on the uh, first. Well, I mean, if if everybody had to go back inside, I mean, everybody, because the, the virus took off again, uh, we'd have, I think, you know, and the, and the government keeps, keeps printing money to help people pay their rent, their mortgage payments, their employees, even though nobody's working. I think people would pretty quickly see that uh, what we have is a lot of paper and very few goods and services, and prices would start to rise uh, dramatically because if people start losing confidence in the, in the dollar. And at the same time, the US is you know, going through this, China and other Asian countries are uh, doing better, uh, not suffering as much. So. You know, it's, it's nothing that says the U.S. dollar can't uh, disappear as the world currency over time. We've seen this happen historically. The Spanish uh, uh, currency and the British currency. Uh, it's uh, uh, so I, I, you know, I think ultimately this is going to happen to the dollar as well. We're not running uh, a, a very prudent uh, set of policies. Uh, you know, obviously right now, I, uh, I think I think the monetary policy and the fiscal policy you're trying to keep people's, uh, keep us from uh, flipping equilibrium. I'm, I'm not uh, trying to say that I'm a hard-nosed neoclassical economist that doesn't believe, that, that believes the economy works perfectly. I don't, indeed, I believe more uh, like Roger in mold equilibria. 
uh, I, that's my view of what happens in recessions. If we flip from a good equilibrium to a bad one, there's a paper on my website called The Big Con, which looks at that, uh, looks at the 2008 recession as really flipping equilibria as opposed to uh, any, any kind of real shock, uh, like a real business cycle shock. So I think uh, what's going on now is not, uh, it's really about trying to maintain the coordination of the economy. Uh, that's with the payroll protection plan, keeping people employed with their current and uh, trying to maintain uh, optimism, but uh, that could disappear pretty quickly and people will start to see all this money uh, uh, you know, it's not like the government has cans of Campbell's soup to give us. All it has is a green piece of paper to print. Eventually that'll take hold in people's minds. So uh, I'm gonna have to beg, beg off, but I want to thank everybody for having me. I, I think, th thank you so much, Larry. I think this is a good point to move into the, the final um, discussion period. So thanks so much, Megan, for um, moderating those last two parts. Um, I'm going to take over on the discussion and could I set the following rules? So um, if you were part of one of the panels and you're still here with us, could you please uh, turn on your video? If you're not part of one of the panels, would you please turn off your video? Um, and everybody has the opportunity um, with, if you press the three little dots, you'll see you have the opportunity, I think, to see only the people that are on the panel, and I think that will um, uh, that that will be uh, you know, easier to to move ahead. Um, I have a large number of questions already. I'm not going to be able to get to all of them. Uh, so uh, as we keep talking, please feel free uh, to add questions uh, onto the chat component. Um, I'm going to just start, I think, by trying to summarize. Um, what I think I've learned from a lot of this discussion. Um, th there's an element of modern monetary theory which is distinctly post-Keynesian uh, and has been raised by many people. I think I mentioned at the outset that uh, I, I have a lot of sympathy with that. Um, and what I take away from the post-Keynesian aspect of this is that, um, so Larry, um, Larry mentioned multiple equilibria. My own view is that there's not just one equilibrium or two equilibrium, but pretty much any level of employment below full employment is potentially an equilibrium. Um, and, that, um, and that I think is, is one of the themes that's coming out in a lot of this, which is that um, if, if the government creates financial resources and spends and we're not in full equilibrium, one of the things that can happen is push us towards constraints. Uh, there's another issue that's come out, um, which uh, I, I'm going to come back to uh, later, which has to do with the difference between money and debt. And I don't think we've explored that uh, nearly, um, nearly enough. So uh, simply financing large amounts of expenditure with money, I, I'm wondering how different that would be to, say, issuing consoles or perpetuities as uh, as the British government did in the Napoleonic Wars. So we'll come back to that question. But first of all, um, I'm going to go into some of the issues and some of the questions that were raised. One that came in very early from Joe Mitchell um, at, the, at the outset, I don't know if he's still with us. Um, he asked in the discussion between Warren and Narayana, uh, he asked about the politics of the question. Um, and in particular, uh, Joe asked me, could you ask Warren to comment on Narayana's point on politics? Is, is MMT an inherently progressive project or is it comfortable with the Trump-Johnson right populist big deficit agenda? So Warren was specifically asked that question. I'm not sure if he's still with us. So uh, any other panel, maybe Anne would like to throw in. I see she's looking uh, to, to bite it the bit there. No, I'll leave no. that. No. Nariana? The, the, the question yeah, I is, mean, uh, I, you know, I, I, obviously I'm sympathetic to the thrust of Joe's question. I'm, I, I'm interested in, you know, if uh, Randy or Stephanie, certainly Stephanie's been, you know, quite active on the progressive side. Um, so I'd be interested in, in, in uh, 
hearing what she thinks of, of uh, how our, our current president and uh, uh, the Republican Party more generally is, I think, now pretty comfortable being an M M MMT party. So um, I wonder what you think about that. Microphone. Right, right. I'm good. I'm on it. I'm on it. So look, I think that uh, a couple of things. First, we have always uh, said, and if Warren were here, uh, I think that, you know, he, he has often said things like, depending on your politics, he would qualify. You know, you, if there's fiscal space available and the MMT lens allows you to identify that fiscal space, that fiscal space could be um, used up by either tax cuts or an increase in spending, he would say, depending on your politics. Now, you could also say that a tax cut could be something that a progressive could advocate, right? Of course. So even tax cuts. Now, we, each of us in our own individual capacities have our own politics, and mine happen to be of a progressive persuasion. So if I see fiscal space out there, I don't want to use up fiscal space by doing things that will widen the gap between those at the very top and everybody else, right? Exacerbating income and wealth inequalities, um, producing, you know, I don't want a brown uh, infrastructure program. Those are not my politics, but that is separate from my ability to analyze as a macroeconomist and use the MMT lens to identify fiscal space. Okay, so um, I, I, I think that's, that probably answers. Does that answer your question, Narayan? I think to a certain extent, I, I think I'm actually trying to make a point that was similar to what Anne was raising, which is, um, is the debate about something like uh, the Green New Deal or even something less expansive than that on the progressive side, is it really, does it really come down to, do you believe in an intertemporal budget constraint for the government? Or is it, do you really, do you want to spend, you, you, you're more comfortable with tax cuts for corporations than you are with uh, spending, spending money on, on items of the progressive agenda? If it's the latter debate, then that seems like that should be the debate that's joined and much less about. Yes. Um, about I, I think that this stuff. stuff is beyond our control. At this point, if I, if, if I got two people, I'm making this up as I go along, so this analogy might fall flat, forgive me, but if I've got two people who both need corrective lenses in order to see, and they both need exactly the same prescription, they're 2040 or whatever, I don't know this stuff, but suppose, and, and I work up the lenses and I give them to the right wing guy and I give them to the left wing guy. Okay, now they can both see more clearly and they say, oh, we don't have to pair this spending with offsets because there's enough fiscal space for the economy to safely absorb this new spending on a Green New Deal project of this or that or the other. This guy puts them on and goes, oh, I can have tax cuts without worrying about inflationary pressures because I see the fiscal space. So what we've done is offer people a lens and with that uh, better understanding, better visualization of where the limits lie, they can pursue policies that I would um, strongly object to personally with my politics or those that I uh, you know, would embrace. But MMT wasn't built to, to, to foster support for, you know, Reagan, I mean, you could say Reagan was an MMT or anybody, you know? So this was all, they had all this stuff figured out long before we came along. Um, um, yeah, Anne, go ahead. Yeah, can I say this is the danger of the MMT lens, basically. I think that, you know, I'm, I'm not a neoclassical economist <laughs> and I disagree with quite a lot of what Larry was saying, but the fact is there are constraints and MMT gives the impression that deficits are surpluses. This is dangerous talk. This is the kind of talk that Weimar loved and that, you know, uh, Trump might like, as well, does like as well. I mean, because neither of those guys uh, committed themselves to looking at and improving and doing something about the economy, they looked at how they could print money, essentially, you know. And so I just think it's really dangerous, this lens. That's the problem with the lens. And, and it's no good saying that, you know, you give people the choice. No, because this is fueling the kind of response that Larry made, which is that, you know, this is all going to be inflationary, which I think is wrong. 
But I think MMT encourages that response, and that's a difficulty. Anyway, I wanted to make other points, and I hope you'll let me come back on that, Roger. Please. Actually, I have a question here for you, Anne, from yeah. uh, Patricia Pino, uh, who says, a uh, question for Anne, you have suggested that countries don't really have sovereignty due to the fact that they can't control their exchange rates. But elsewhere, you say that we should outfinance in its place and make it a servant to the economy. Aren't these positions contradictory? And how are we to control finance if governments don't have sovereignty? Um, well, that's, those are the big questions. And the simple answers are that, um, are that we end the, we transform the current model, which is based on capital mobility, which is based on prioritizing the creditor, creditor's interests, that is based on the interests of investors, speculators, and creditors. And we transform that model and we uh, introduce capital controls. We give central banks powers to manage not just the base rate, not the central bank rate, but across the spectrum of rates. This is Keynes's liquidity preference theory, which I think was revolutionary and is always ignored. Um, and, and that autonomy, that policy autonomy is what will restore uh, sovereignty. At the, at the moment, the system is designed to deny sovereignty to governments. The ECB is the classic example of, um, of the system, which is that, you know, the states of, the, of Europe are denied, absolutely denied policy autonomy. Um, they have to rely on technocrats at the ECB for financing. So um, my answer to that question. So, so if I could uh, actually, before I throw that out, I, and I can see Vito biting, I, I'll get to you in a second, Vito. So um, I'm really fascinated, Anne, to hear your position uh, on on globalization, um, uh, I, you've you've talked about restricting capital markets. Um, coming into into Brexit, uh, yeah. God knows that I would actually breathe these words again at this point. But there there was a left wing and a right wing position, both in favour of Brexit. And do you mm -hmm. think that um, th they're compatible with each other? And how do you see that related to what you're talking about I in terms of the globalization project? I thought they were both pretty reactionary, really. Um, I mean, they are left nationalists and right nationalists, really. That's the difference. Um, but the fact, of the matter, I mean, it is complicated, Roger. My position is complicated because I think what has happened in Britain and what has happened in the United States, in Brazil, in India, is a massive reaction to, uh, you know, management of the economy by financial markets. And it may not, it may not be understood but it is um, the public understands that our governments no longer are in, in control of the show, basically, that they, they say, sorry, when, when you lose your job to some Chinese company, that's just show business. You know, they shrug their shoulders and say, that's the market. When they say, uh, you know, your interest rates on your little overdraft, your, your big overdraft, your little company is 28% and the central bank rate is 0.25% tough, you know, that's the market. Uh, go somewhere else if you if you want a, a different overdraft. So um, so it, that sense of impotence uh, is is what gave rise to both left and right nationalism, and they're both wrong in my view, and they're wrong because from my point of view, I think international cooperation and coordination is absolutely vital, especially in, in relation to the climate, but also in terms of the. The, this is what was good about the Bretton Woods system, was that built into it was multilateral action, was international cooperation. And that was broken down by the uh, introduction of neoliberal policies after Nixon. So, so you, you, want, um, you want to have international cooperation, but close the capital markets. Is that fair? To I say? don't close the capital markets. I want to manage Regulate. I want to manage the capital markets. At the moment, the idea is that they should not be managed at all, that they should be free to do as they like. If they want to leave South Africa at the moment of a, a crisis and flood in capital flight back to the dollar for safety, that they should be free to do. And I disagree with that because I believe that South Africa should have the sovereignty to manage its economy in order to deal with crises like this pandemic. And that should not be subordinated to the interests of international creditors, investors, and speculators. V Vitor, I see you, you, I think you had something to add to that. Is that? Oh, uh, exactly what, uh, Roger? ECB. I don't know, I, I saw, I, I saw oh, you. ECB, the ECB thing, well, two, two points. 
Uh, first, before that, just uh, let me comment on the uh, question of uh, um, taming finance. I agree that uh, uh, our systems have been subject to uh, too much finance and that uh, uh, the system to work has to uh, really try to tame uh, finance. What we see uh, is that through different ways, um, shadow banking, but not only, uh, the, the, the explosion of uh, the repo market, uh, all the uh, OTC derivatives and so on, and so on allowed an uh, enormous creation of inside liquidity in the system that in times of stress mm -hmm. or crisis or lack of confidence uh, collapses and then the uh, authorities, meaning the uh, central banks, have to then suddenly provide lots of outside liquidity just to keep the system afloat. This is as happened 10 years ago. This was happening now when the Fed stepped in in a huge way, much uh, uh, stronger than in 2008, to do the same. Uh, and the system, in my view, cannot live like this forever. And it has proved that the reforms that were applied uh, after 2008 were insufficient to really control the creation of inside liquidity and leverage in the system as a whole. Only the banking sector was more regulated and constrained uh, and virtually nothing else. And that's why we continue to see the increase in the importance in GDP of the financial sector. We continue to see increase in depth of every agent and, and so on. So this means that the financial regulation should be changed, but that's not a competence of central banks. Uh, I'm sorry, and uh, really, uh, it's of governments. And uh, regarding the ECB and the, the role of the ECB in the monetary union, well, it was the governments that created the monetary union. It's not the ECB. The ECB is doing its job as it was commanded uh, by the governments to do. Uh, that's what is happening. Now, they may not like it anymore. That's another subject, but it's again, not for the ECB to say it. Uh, so, um, but I think we are, uh, except with this uh, point about uh, financialization and the excesses of that, Besides that point, we are, uh, you know, uh, uh, going away from the main subject of our uh, discussion. So I will stop that answer here, uh, hoping that there are other questions. I, I have a question here from Tony Curzon Price, yes. uh, and I think this is to Randy and Stephanie. Uh, uh, Tony says, given that money is required to pay taxes, what would modern monetary theory predict if national currencies did not have a national monopoly for settlement in non-taxation transactions? Is that legal monopoly required for creating a national currency economy, or does it arise without the threat of law? Well, I, I think he's describing what actually exists right now. Nobody's required to use uh, the federal government's currency to, to settle payments. Um, I think Anne was trying to make a point earlier that the vast majority of the money supply is privately created. Of course, of course it is. Uh, she, she said, <clears throat> I, I think this was probably a slip, that it was created uh, to finance the real economy, but actually the vast majority of uh, financial assets and liabilities don't have anything to do with the government and don't have anything to do with the real economy. Uh, it's just purely this financialization of uh, our economies. And uh, maybe net settlement ultimately might be done in the central bank's reserves, but there's lots and lots of settlement mm -hmm. that has nothing to do with currency. I, I, I'm not sure what Tony meant by that. I mean, it, uh, it, uh, uh, to add yeah, something. go ahead. Uh, very as briefly uh, as I can. Um, bank money is, of course, dominant, as we know. And most of it, I would submit, is necessary to the normal function of the economy. It would not work uh, without uh, money uh, created by the banks because uh, there are uh, exchange needs uh, that require 
the existence of that money. Now, there may be credit booms and excesses in uh, credit money creation, yes. And by the way, this is one point where I criticize MMT because MMT tends to ignore the effects of the credit market and of, of, of the bank money, which uh, overwhelms the uh, uh, money in the economy. And by uh, adopting a policy, a consistent policy of low interest rates because uh, of the assignment of tasks between uh, fiscal and monetary policies, the MMT approach with those uh, uh, consistently low uh, interest rates fosters credit booms, fosters the possibility of creation of uh, uh, inflationary pressures that will make the task of fiscal policy to control inflation much more difficult. So I don't think that it is correct uh, to ignore first the role of monetary policy in that and to ignore the role and the risks with, which are attached to the overwhelming form of uh, uh, credit money creation that we have in our economies. I think Anne had something. Can, can I say that we don't ignore this at all? Uh, I, actually, the majority of my writing has been on the, the private financial part of our system, not on the government part. What we disagree with is trying to use the interest rate to control the private financial system. I, we would agree, I think, and you agree, we need more regulation. Yeah. Maybe the central bank shouldn't be doing it, but we need a lot more regulation of financial markets, and, and well, that's the way that we prevent this, the speculative booms, not by the interest rate. I agree with the need of regulation, and I mentioned that before, regarding also the non-bank part of the financial system. Yes. But uh, in what regard uh, banks, uh, they are more regulated now than uh, uh, ever before. And to do via regulation the containment of uh, uh, credit booms with the maintenance of very low monetary policy rates, as you advocate, it requires then a very restrict and radical way of regulating the banks by having credit ceilings as the IMF imposed in developing countries over decades, or by having a, a mandatory uh, um, leverage limit to, to loans, or some other type of quantitative restriction to the activity of banks. We, and uh, I have read your books, and I never saw that you went as far as defending credit ceilings or other forms of regulation that, in my view, disregarding inflation, uh, interest rates would be required to contain those type of credit booms with the consistently policy of low rates. I, I'd like to, to jump in here. Um, uh, it's partly related to this discussion on regulation and partly related to the boundary of fiscal and monetary policy. Um, one of the things I've found in my own re research, so when we talk about fiscal policy, we tend to think about uh, expect government expenditures and government taxation. Um, there's another aspect of fiscal policy which relates to the financial markets. One of the things you find if you look closely uh, at data uh, in the United States and a number of other countries is a, a very close, uh, low frequency relationship between wealth uh, and unemployment. Uh, so um, I, I found looking, for example, at post-war US data, that um, uh, the, the, the real value of the stock market, which is about two thirds of, of, uh, of the US economy in terms of wealth, um, if the stock market crashes by 10% uh, and stays down for three months, it's always followed by a significant uh, increase in unemployment. So one of the things I've been arguing uh, in, in my own work is that instead of thinking as fiscal policy as simply interaction, uh, interacting in the goods markets is to think of more comprehensive regulation um, in the financial markets. So when uh, Vitor raised the issue earlier, I believe it was Vitor, yes. uh, that at some point um, we should be, that central banks may need to go back to their core function uh, 
of, inf of fighting inflation by controlling interest rates, uh, I would argue very strongly that there is no reason that at the same time central banks should give up um, on the mandate that some central banks have to think about the real economy. Oh, yeah. And they can do that by using a second tool of directly uh, uh, influencing financial markets. So if the central bank were to raise interest rates or do whatever they thought was necessary uh, to bring inflation under control, there would be nothing to stop them at the same time from intervening heavily in the asset markets to prevent um, a, a crash in, in, uh, in, for example, the stock market that would inevitably be associated with a subsequent recession. Um, I don't know if anybody wants to th throw in something there. I know Narayana's thought about this quite a lot as well. Um, but, uh, or anybody indeed. Oh, just uh, two words. I mean, I think uh, in, in, in Europe it's impossible by law. By yes. Treaty, you know, but okay, you, you were talking about other countries. I understood that. Narayana, please. No, I was going to say, I think. Um, you know, in the U.S., we have our uh, the Fed has its two mandates on employment and inflation, um, or employment and inflation, more more correctly. Um, there are those who believe that the Fed has a floor on the value of the stock market already, um, and uh, uh, which I guess from your you would actually be in favor of establishing that kind of kind of a policy or am I misunderstanding what you're saying? Robert? No, I would be. I, I, I would be in favor of a financial policy that targeted uh, the growth rate of, uh, of a broad index of stocks. Uh, and yeah. I, would, I would control that. You know, a lot of models that ends up being pretty close to being equivalent to, uh, to uh, targeting uh, employment, uh, max employment and-, and, and uh, It's exactly uh, what it would be. What's that? That's exactly what it would be. And in fact, the I would advocate a rule that used employment as a, as, as a mechanism to decide whether asset prices should be growing faster or slower. I see. Yeah, I think, I think uh, from a political standpoint, you know, at less than an economic one, um, there's, there's often viewed to be a tension between the value. There might be a, sometimes a, a, a tension between the value of the stock market and the interests of other, other uh, parties in the, in, in the economy. You might even argue that's true right now. Um, and then I think having a, a, a policy that we're trying to make asset prices grow rapidly to, to keep the economy healthy um, might be challenging for people to, to, so that's part of that is just a, a political point, but also economically, I think the class of models you're thinking about might be narrow relative to the class of models we might have to, might have to think about and consider. That is, the stock market itself might not be a true measure of health of the, of, I, I, you know, I, I'd say wealth in general, but I'd, I'd also add that in somewhere like the UK, housing wealth is more important, for example. Right. Uh, and you saw the, the Bank of England concentrating on housing wealth in, in, uh, in the Great Recession. Um, I, I'll just say, we'll add one thing, which builds on what uh, Vitor was saying, and, and that, um, one concern that people at the Fed had about this, you know, Jeremy Stein has spoken about this among others, that, that if you follow a policy that tries, to, uh, rapid increases in asset prices can be followed by sharp reversals in asset prices. And uh, that you might be, might be hard to, to mitigate very quickly. And, and then you're gonna have, that's gonna spill over to the real economy. So if you're, if you're pumping up the stock market, you might be, uh, Maybe, yeah, but, uh, but, but Mariana, to be, to be clear, the, poli the policy is not suggesting to put a floor on the stock market, it's to put bounds on the growth rate of the stock market. Stock market yeah. So that involves stopping it from growing too quickly as well as from... Ah, I see. Okay, that's helpful. But, and, if the problem is unemployment, why don't you tackle the, the problem directly rather than trying to uh, bump up the stock market to solve the unemployment problem? Well, this comes back to, to the, the policy that you suggested, I believe, of, of uh, uh, an employer of last resort, which, which I think is an extraordinarily interesting policy. Um, but again, there I would say, um, why would, uh, is there a version of that policy that in which it would not be purely the government that was extending jobs, but um, a, a government-funded policy that would encourage 
um, private entrepreneurs or firms to step in and create those jobs using the same funding scheme that might have been used uh, for, for, for government policy. Well, I, I would not use not uh, for-profit firms. And the, the, the reason is because you're subsidizing somebody's labor costs and maybe not somebody else's. And I think there you create lots of incentive problems. But yes, we would decentralize the job guarantee program. I mean, it's going to depend a lot on which country you're talking about. We're talking about the United States. Decentralize, use mostly not-for-profit, uh, use various levels of government. So the federal government would not be necessarily the one that is creating the jobs, but providing the funding. And the idea is a decentralized program is more likely to provide uh, useful services using the employees in the program. And I see you were trying to jump in there. Yes, can I change the subject from the, the job guarantee? Um, I have a real problem with MMT's use of the term deficit funding and deficit financing. And, and I think, and, 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 and I need to say this, that um, I'm a great admirer of Wynne Godley and of his sectoral balances. Um, I learned a great deal and I benefited a great deal from his work on that. So I, I mean, but for me, sectoral balances are an outcome. The deficit is an outcome of economic policy. It's not the means for financing the policy. So it seems crazy to me to say, you know, that we understand the nature of money which is that the Fed can create, uh, uh, let's call it money, uh, for the, with the exchange of assets, can, and, and this is what all money is, a promise to pay. The Fed can promise to pay. Um, and, um, but my problem is that when we then say that is, is the way things are financed, we then talk about deficit financing as if, as if we're being- We don't, we never say that. Or deficit, I heard- no I heard. such thing. Well, sorry, but I've just heard Stephanie use the term, and I no, hear it all the time. We never say it. We would never say it. It's nonsense. So what is, so what is the term that I've been hearing, or my, uh, mishearing, should I say? We Maybe will, I've been mishearing. She, she told you Congress authorizes the spending and they spend. We won't know whether there was a deficit till the end of the year. Yeah, exactly. The, it's the a quantum The spending takes, doesn't depend on whether you're going to end up with a deficit or a surplus at the end of the year. We never yeah. say that. So I, where does the term deficit spending come from? Orthodox. <laughs> we don't say that. Right. Sorry, I withdraw then. Uh, so here's a, a general question. Um, I, I, I think that it's, it's not been widely noticed that the monetary system changed dramatically uh, about five or six years ago when central banks started paying interest on uh, reserves. And um, that appears to me to uh, blur the distinction between government debt uh, and money. And I wonder if anybody would like to comment on, uh, on that point, particularly as it relates to um, what Larry, so Larry Kotlikoff said before he left. Um, he, he imagined that we might return to a situation um, where the money multiplier reemerged. Um, and um, that's something that concerns me, but I, I think the only way that a money multiplier would reemerge in that, in that way would be if the opportunity cost of holding what we sometimes think of as narrow money were to rise. And that opportunity cost is no longer the interest rate. It's the gap between, uh, well, it's, it's essentially zero once you're paying interest on reserves. Uh, so we're, we're in a kind of depression era liquidity trap now. Uh, in, in, in all aspects of, of monetary financing. That's a personal view. I'd like, Randy was about to say yeah. something. We, we always said that uh, bonds are a reserve drain, uh, and we needed that because we didn't pay interest on reserves. As soon as we part, start paying interest on reserves, we don't need to drain excess reserves out of the system in order to hit the overnight rate target. So effectively paying interest on reserves serves exactly the same function as bonds, so there's no reason to sell them anymore. So we, we've always said that since the middle of the 1990s. So finally the Fed started paying interest on reserves, they said, okay, well, we don't have to sell bonds anymore. Uh, anybody else want to comment on that? Yeah, uh, it, it, what 
uh, in the US in particular, because it's still paying positive uh, uh, rates on the reserves, uh, we also started to do that uh, uh, at the ECB. Initially, they were positive, but then they became negative, as you know. But uh, with that situation, that approach, um, indeed what, for instance, QE does is just substituting one type of debt with longer maturity for a shorter maturity debt that also pays an interest. So indeed it, uh, it extracts duration from the system, so it reduces risk, and that's one of the uh, um, things that uh, QE uh, intends uh, to do, but it's not really, um, you know, full-fledged monetization of the debt is another form uh, of, uh, of debt. What is also important in my view for, for the future, uh, uh, it's still to be decided both by the Fed and by the ECB for the future, is uh, in my view, the central banks should keep a, a so-called floor system, a way of controlling the short-term uh, uh, interest rates which implies that they have to maintain a um, situation of sort of excess liquidity in the interbank market in order then to have the system of uh, remunerating the reserves or doing uh, reserve, uh, reverse repos and uh, accept that non-banks also uh, can use that facility in order to, via that system, control or have an influence on short-term interest rates and not going back to the whole system of uh, just doing open market operations and try to guess what would be the effects uh, and the needs of the system that would then condition the uh, outcome of uh, the level of interest rates. So combining that, uh, it's really keeping this floor system approach of managing uh, liquidity in short-term markets would be important uh, for the future, but it changes, of course, as Roger said, uh, the nature of the whole implementation of monetary policy. Uh, to, I just clarify. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think the uh, uh, you know, unfortunately, Larry Larry uh, Kolakov's not still with us. Uh, I think that uh, um, the notion of the quantity theory really goes back to a time when when. Uh, the, the, the central banks weren't paying interest on reserves. Yeah. And as soon as you start to pay interest on reserves, then it's, you're not going to get some, a relationship like that. Basically the central bank balance sheet can be arbitrarily large and, and it doesn't put any, and there's no relationship between that and, and, the, and the inflation of the price level. So. Right. It's, it's also an interesting question. And th there seems to be a lot of concern in the public domain about central banks in some sense becoming uh, bankrupt. Uh, which seems to me a, to be an entirely empty question. The, the, the Israeli central bank, for example, has had a negative balance sheet now for decades. Yeah. Um, or the Czech Republic uh, central bank. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I don't think, uh, yeah, that's, I, don't, I don't view that as a major concern in the United States at all, so. Yeah. Right. Um, so uh, we've got a few minutes left, so I'm going to raise one more question. Um, for the panel, and then I think we'll, we'll wrap up. Uh, a number of people have been asking, uh, not surprisingly, um, of how uh, this whole discussion relates to uh, COVID-19 um, <laughs> and, and how, uh, you know, what sort of constraints uh, you see um, on the economy moving forward. And I would throw my own slam on that, which is that there's been a lot of discussion about inflation um, I think the, uh, the interesting question is not so much inflation, but how much of the, uh, the, the redistribution that's been going on um, in terms of finances will, will result in a spike in the price level, which I think personally is inevitable, uh, which is not necessarily going to be translated into an increase in inflation. I wonder how, monetary, how modern monetary theory sees the distinction between those two, um, those two points, which is something that classical mm -hmm. Economics. Yeah, you had asked about stagflation. I was going to say, well, we already got the stag part. Mm. So the question is, can we get the flation part? And you could construct a scenario uh, where we could, and I think Larry was sort of on to this. So if we keep mailing out checks, and if we 
increased the amount tremendously um, while the supply side uh, is not functioning very well, um, then you could see a scenario where we could get inflation. Um, I don't, it's not going to be the people making their mortgage payments. The average American owes something like $4,000 a month just paying their bills. Uh, so that first $4,000 they are getting from the government is simply going to pay bills. That's not going to be inflationary at all. So we're going to have to get way beyond $4,000 a month, I think, to uh, get much inflation. Now, because of the way the CPI is constructed, uh, if we had a, a few major components um, where the price rises were big and uh, we don't have much going on in the uh, parts of the CPI where the average uh, workers are uh, buying stuff, then you could see you could get a, a just a, the index could be going up. But is it a problem? No, probably not. Anyone else like to throw in a, a last word here? Well, no. Stephanie. I, I was going to say, I think um, this is almost certainly a deflationary episode. Could something happen if Randy's imagining that, you know, Congress is going to pass uh, additional um, legislation that includes the you know large payments on a per person basis going month after month after month in an environment where suppose much of the productive capacity is permanently offline and you get a combination of those two things happening then yeah i think um it it makes sense to imagine that you could have a sort of stagflation type uh event at some point but I, look uh, the odds of us mailing out big checks to everyone since have, have you looked at Congress? It ain't happening. So, uh, so I, I don't see where that is going to come from. I do think that in specific categories, yeah, if health insurance premiums go up by 40% uh, in an environment where rental costs are down, the housing market struggles, you know, if, if there is enough oil prices, <clears throat> Um, even a substantial uptick in a single category could push headline inflation higher. So, but like Randy said, is that, is that the sort of thing we would normally call an inflationary uh, episode? No. It's really yeah, I think the Fed is, I, I agree that everything that uh, Stephanie and Randy are saying on this, but I think there might be inflationary spikes. I think the Fed is going to really try hard to look through anything like that. Um, you know, you would have to see really strong evidence that somehow those spikes were moving inflation expectations. I think these are, you know, everything, anything is possible, but I, I view this as a very unlikely scenario. Yeah, but nevertheless, I agree with that, but also with Roger, uh, depending on the degree of damage that the supply side has suffered, and we don't know exactly, yeah. we could see some price level spikes. I agree, I agree with that totally. But I go further, I think, I'd hope we do. But, yeah. but surely, yeah. right. but not, surely infl not inflation point, though. It depends, <clears throat> surely it depends on economic policy. I mean, it depends on policy, doesn't it, above all? So we can't, I mean, what we're going to see, in my view, is a load of bankruptcies, mm -hmm. a load of, uh, and even some fun, and banks, I think, are going to be in, in Britain, the high street is in deep trouble. Landlords are not going to be able to collect rent. Businesses are going to flee the high street. Mm. Um, and when they can't pay their rents, uh, there are going to be problems for the bank. So I see this as really a long-term set of failures um, and, and a period of depression, severe depression ahead, and of deflation, as Stephanie says. But that would depend on whether government decides just to let things happen or whether or not it decides it's going to create jobs, it's going to, you know, try and compensate for those losses. I think Stephanie was yeah, talking so from the US perspective. Out. In the <laughs> from the US perspective, and I agree with her there, I think I think we know what the answer on policy is going to be, unfortunately. Um, yeah, that's a lot of support for the economy coming uh, you know, depending on what happens in November, but uh, at this moment I don't see much more happening. 
Well, on that positive note, um, I think uh, this is a good point to uh, wrap up the, the discussion. Um, and thank you all for participating in this. Um, I hope we can do more of this at Rebuilding Macroeconomics. We're trying very, very hard to uh, encourage discussion much more broadly between different views of economics, um, bringing in people from different social sciences and even from, uh, from non-social sciences. Um, I see Angus has just joined us, Megan is back, so uh, I don't know if either of you would like to say a few words. Thank you so much, Megan, for joining me and helping to organize all of this. Um, and thank you, Angus, for giving us the, uh, the, the platform to put, to put it out. Megan, would you? You no, know, just thank you, everyone, for joining. It was a great discussion. Yeah. Yes, and on behalf of Rebuilding Macroeconomics, thank you, Roger and Megan. But all of the speakers, have been a, a fasc fascinating afternoon, and we're very, very grateful, and we look forward to continuing the discussion. So thank you all very much indeed, and have a good evening. Thank you. I'm off for breakfast. Bye. Bye now. Bye. Bye. Bye.